here I'm back. <laughs> I close everything. <laughs> now, I was saying that if I had the chance, I will try to watch it because it's a huge story and of all mankind, like the, the different events that we have in, this, in our history of everyone in the world. So it's a, I always wonder why they don't did that kind of movie, but maybe the context of that area of, of that time, uh, maybe they they want to see what what happened really, or they want they don't want to remember what happened really, you know, build a, an atomic bomb for science is good, but for doing depends on the where they they own or what you're going to or the way that you're going to use it so that's maybe that's why they didn't want to to do it well and at the time in real time the probability was that hitler would have one before the united states so it, there was no choice really yeah. to go but to go ahead with the manhattan project yeah that, that's true that's true yeah but unfortunately, the, the Nazis came to always, uh, uh, they escaped and they, you know, when you talk about Argentina, they always say that we receive the German or the Nazis with the open arms, but now not. Um, they escaped and we, we found a submarine in the coast of our country. They're going to study and see if a German is and if it's a German submarine. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, you know, we have a, a battle here in the Rio de la Plata. There uh, we sunk a, a boat of German, I remember. And Uruguay uh, did a, an exploration and they captured the, the eagle of the with the Nazi symbol and everything. And I think I don't know if they destroy it or I don't know I don't remember, but uh, I don't know. Um, there are people that they are cover the Nazis, but there are also people that they don't want it to be here. And also they went to another place like Brazil and, and every part of South America, unfortunately. Well, gentlemen, are you guys uh, ready to get started? Yes. Yes. Here, we are. here, okay, here comes here we Cesar. Go. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Hi. Whoa. So X-rays really shows us that uh, the universe is very energetic. We find X-rays in jets, erupting from the centers of active galaxies. We use them to measure the spin of black holes or supernova explosions. It takes a powerful event to produce cosmic X-rays. Sometimes people also call it the hot universe, because you know when you have this gas in galaxy clusters or also around galaxies that you can see only in space. This gas is about 10 million to 100 million of degrees, which is so hot that this gas does not radiate in, in optical, does not radiate in infrared, but it only radiates in X-ray. To further understand these hottest regions, we need the next generation X-ray telescope. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, is partnering with NASA and the European Space Agency to launch the next generation X-ray space telescope. The telescope, called CRISM, launches from the Tonegashima Space Center at the southern end of Japan on an H-2A rocket. The spacecraft weighs over 5,000 pounds, stands over 30 feet tall, and will orbit approximately 340 miles above Earth. We're familiar with the medical use
surfaces of x-rays. X-ray light is energetic enough to pass through our skin. Our calcium-dense bones absorb that light, blocking it from reaching the detector and creating a shadow. Luckily for us, x-rays from space don't make it through our atmosphere. But what that does mean is that we have to send x-ray hunting missions into orbit to detect this high energy light. PRISM also needs special kinds of mirrors, which were built at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. The type of the mirror is uh, called a nested mirror. Uh, it looks like a, like a cross section of an onion. X-rays are so energetic, they fly right through typical mirrors. For the visible light, we typically place the mirror like, like this, so the light just bounces back. But uh, uh, for the x-rays, uh, this doesn't work, so that we put the mirror like, like this, like a, uh, so that x-ray just graze surface of the uh, shell. When they strike the mirrors at very shallow angles, x-rays too can bounce. And then so we made it uh, like a conical shell like this, then uh, x-ray can be PRISM has two instruments, each with their own mirror assembly. One for imaging, called EXTEND, the other for spectroscopy, called RESOLVE. JAXA built EXTEND to provide PRISM with a wide field of view. It can observe an area about 60% larger than the average apparent size of the full moon. NASA's RESOLVE instrument is a spectrometer that splits X-ray light, like a prism. So scientists can detect specific elements present in the sources they're studying. It uses a small six by six pixel detector called a micro calorimeter, nestled in a refrigerator sized container of liquid helium. RESOLVE will measure the small temperature changes caused when X-rays hit one of those pixels. To track such small temperature changes, Resolve's detectors must be kept extremely cold. That liquid helium cryocooler will keep the instrument at 0 0.05 degrees Kelvin. It's so cold, it is a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. Heat is simply a product of moving atoms. Keeping Resolve's detector that cold means that the Okay. But PRISM really has this capability of decomposing this X-ray light in a way that much, much more X-ray recording has ever been done.
Guys, we are getting uh, audio problems right now. I don't know why, um, but um, I think it's gonna frustrate the audience here. So let me reconfigure the audio and I will come back. So give me about five minutes, <laughs> so, okay. So Mike, you can hear me now, okay? But uh, the audio is pretty low for, the, uh, for all the video stuff, so. Um, and perhaps what we do, you know what, guys? Let's forget about the, uh, the videos. I, I, uh, ben, you're saying just uh, turn the video audio up. It's not that simple. There's, there's some sort of configuration problem. Um, I updated Zoom and it didn't like it. So, um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to do this the old fashioned way. And I will uh, um, uh, talk a little bit about our, uh, our presenters tonight. Uh, we've got, again, we have just a great lineup of speakers, uh, starting with David Levy. Um, uh, giving us poetry and commentary. David Eicher, who's going to talk about the bubble nebula in his uh, Dave's Exotic Deep Sky Objects. Carol Orge is going to talk about Astronomy Day, which is an important program for astronomers everywhere, everywhere, but also to the Astronomical League. Carrie Latelier is going to join us from Chile. She's just got back from uh, some major trips. She has been going around the world making all these incredible night sky photographs. And uh, so I, I know that you're gonna love that. Uh, young Navin Sintel Kumar, who's been kind of growing up with us in Global Star Party, is, um, uh, is gonna be talking about space flight tonight. Daniel Barth will join us uh, here. Uh, if you don't know it, uh, Daniel uh, retired from teaching, but he's taking kind of a retirement job here at Explore Scientific, which is so cool. So I get to see him every day. Maxi Falaris uh, is going to talk about uh, his astrophotography. He's always got new work and stuff like that. Adrian Bradley joins us. Cesar Brolo will be with us as well. Um, I see all these guys in the background here. Marcello Souza uh, from Brazil will be joining us. And of course, John Schwartz all the way from California. So um, we will uh, go ahead and get started with uh, Dr. David Levy. What crowd is this? What have we here? We must not pass it by. A telescope upon its frame and pointed to the sky. Long as it is a barber's pole or mast of little boat, some little pleasure skiff that doth on Thames' waters float. This poem is called Stargazers by William Wordsworth, who was England's poet laureate until 1850. When two things happened, he passed away in 1850 and Queen Victoria appointed Alfred Lord Tennyson to follow him as Poet Laureate. And uh, while I was doing my master's work at Queen's University up in Canada, I uh, read Stargazers and I fell in love with it. And I found a way to include it in my thesis. And when my advisor, Dr. McKenzie was looking at it, his comment was, Wordsworth has written some wretched verse. And I thought that was the funniest comment I could get. And, uh, but he didn't tell me to take the poem out. So the poem is here, still lives as a part of my thesis and a part of the books that followed it. The showman chooses as well as place till Leicester squares he square. And he is happy in his night for the heavens are blue and fair. Calm though impatient is the crowd, each is ready with the fee, and envies him that's looking what an insight might it be, might it be. Yet showman, where can lie the cause? Shall thy implement have blame? A bolster that even tried, fails and is put to shame. Or is it good as others are, and be their eyes at fault? Or their eyes or minds, or finally, is this resplendent bolt? And so he's wondering, do we blame the telescope? Do we blame the sky? I don't know. But uh, the theme of this week's Global Star Party is instruments for observing. And I wanted to start not with uh, instruments from outer space, but my own telescopes. 
Miranda is a 16 inch telescope with which I've discovered, I think it was eight of my nine visual comet discoveries. I don't have Miranda anymore. It is now at the Dorner Telescope Museum of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I do have other telescopes. My favorite now is Eureka, a 12 inch that I got from Scotty. And uh, this morning, just a few hours ago, I observed Comet Nishimura with it. If you know where to look, it's easy and it's bright. It's about seventh magnitude and brightening by the day. It's just a beautiful comet. I recommend it all to you. And uh, when you go see it, then you have to go see Oppenheimer, which is, I think, one of the best movies of our generation. It is about the atomic age. And I also need to say that I was at Trinity site a few years ago with Wendy and David Rossiter. And we actually saw the monument at Trinity site, which bears witness to the birth of the atomic age. And uh, so it is now time for me to finish this poem. Whatever be the cause to sure that they who pry and pour it seem to meet with little gain, seem less happy than before. Have you ever had a telescope out when people would look expecting to see stuff from the Hubble and they get to see just what your telescope has to show? I have to say, I've never looked through a telescope and not been excited by what I see. But I've seen people who really were bored by it and didn't like it. And, uh, but I think everything I've seen through a telescope, whether it's mine or yours or any of the others, it's just been wonderful. One after one, they take their turns, nor have I one espied that doth not slackly go away as if dissatisfied. Dissatisfied for them, perhaps, for me, never. Thank you all, and back to you, Scotty Roberts. Well, thank you very much, David. That's great, that's great. So uh, leave it to David to be able to find poetry that uh, perfectly matches our uh, theme. So thank you very much. Okay, all right. So um, up next uh, is David Eicher. David has been uh, out in Boston. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, at Stellafane, you know, Stel the Stellafane meeting celebrated its centennial this year. A hundred years of Stellafane. Wow. So I was happy to get back there and see lots of friends at Stella Fane. And then, uh, of course, being a history type guy, among other things, I had to take three days and see everything in Boston. Refight the Revolutionary War. <laughs> Refight it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we won again, you know, so I was a little, yeah, I was slightly surprised, but, you know, it turned yeah. out the, the right way again. That's right. That's great. So you're going to be talking about the Bubble Nebula. <laughs> Yeah, so I will see if I can share my screen. Now, I've been talking about some real challenge objects. This one is a little bit brighter than the norm here. It's not quite okay. as obscure as uh, as some of the objects that I'll be talking about and have talked about. Um, this is one, this is the Centaurus A here, the placeholder, the, the opening slide, but the Bubble Nebula is an object that is reasonably bright. It has a relatively uh, decently high surface brightness. So you can see it with a moderate sized telescope in a dark sky relatively easily. And, you know, Cassiopeia is a, you know, the northern sky doesn't have the greatest collection of rich deep sky objects compared to the deep south. But Cassiopeia is a pretty rich area of the northern sky. It's a great piece of Milky Way. And there are lots and lots of open clusters that are very nice there and also nebulae of different types of both emission nebulae and planetary nebulae. So this is a good example of an emission nebula. The bubble, it's known of its catalog number is NGC 7635. Uh, and it has not its brightest part that's rather spread out in a sort of a rectangular form more or less, but but the central faint part that is hard harder to see visually is a bubble that's excited by a very hot, very young star. Um, and so uh, it is an object that you definitely can go after if you have a good sky with a six or an eight inch telescope visually. 
The bubble altogether is about 10th magnitude as an object, a whole emission nebula, and it's about 15 by eight arc minutes across. So it's pretty large, the total extent of this object. It's about 8,000 light years away from us, uh, relatively close to us in the Milky Way. Um, and the really faint bubble that, from which the object derives its name uh, is illuminated by this ninth magnitude star, SAO 2575, that is uh, really hot, uh, this very young blue star, uh, and is ionizing the bubble to glow in a very nice uh, symmetrical uh, sphere, if you will. It's a very rich field also. There are lots of objects around the bubble nebula that you can see. And if you have a wide field eyepiece in a dark sky, you'll see a lot of stuff in addition to the, the bubble with a small scope. There's a bright open cluster, M50, M52, that's very close to the, the bubble and a bunch of other fainter nebulae, including NGC 7538, a Sharpless nebula, and IC 1470. So it's a really rich area of the Cassiopeia Milky Way. Here's the uh, Ron Stoyan Interstellarum Deep Sky Atlas chart showing the bubble nebula in the center, more or less there, bubble nebel uh, there in, in German. Um, and you can see this sort of scattered uh, region of all sorts of clusters and nebulae along the plane of the galaxy there that runs from upper left to lower right. So it's a very rich area to explore. This is uh, one of Adam Block's shots of the bubble nebula, and you can see the bubble in the center there, and this whole uh, patch of nebulosity is really the bubble nebula, um, but the central spherical bubble is what the object derives its name from, of course, and you can see the bright star in the center there that's below uh, the center of the bubble is the exciting star that, uh, that creates that glowing bubble that we see. The Hubble Space Telescope does a little bit better, of course, with this object, no disrespect to Adam, uh, but that's a pretty good telescope of the Hubble still. This is its shot of the bubble nebula in very high resolution, and you can see a lot of this material um, at the upper left that's blowing out with protostars and uh, creating at the ends of those tunnels of dark and light nebulosity um, some infant suns, just like uh, we've seen a little more easily in objects like the Orion Nebula. This is a Ron Brecker's photo of the, the bubble. It's a nice wide field shot, and you can see M52 is an upper uh, right there um, in the in the, uh, the field, and, and this is easily a low power field takes in all of this and more. So you can see quite a lot of stuff in a very, very rich star field. It's a good thing we don't have to count the stars in this area of the Milky Way. Um, and then I have some breaking news, if you will, because Tony Hallis sent me the this image and the next image about two hours ago. These are from last night. Tony coincidentally happened to shoot the bubble um, and his stuff is just incredible. You know, the stuff that Tony is doing um, in very high resolution. This is actually with a large uh, stellar view refractor at his very dark site in uh, Northern California. So there's the bubble, the center of the bubble, and then here's a wide field shot. And you can see wow. M52, of course, on the left edge there. And it's just, a you know, the stuff that he's doing, this is just a completely kind of new look, you know, from the way we're used to seeing these deep sky yeah. objects. You know, Tony is really on a a sort of a unique level here. It's just crazy, the stuff that he's doing. So this is brand new from last night, an image of the bubble and unrehearsed with, by totally by coincidence. Um, he sent this along. And so I'll mention, uh, that's all I have on the bubble nebula. It's a good object. It's not quite as challenging as some of the super faint stuff I've been talking about. And I'll talk about how it's astronomy's uh, 50th anniversary year still, we're celebrating that. Uh, Michael Bakich and I have recently produced this book, A Child's Introduction to Space Exploration, that we hope is inspiring a, a number of young kids to get excited about the new era of space that's rolling along. And then I will mention once again the Starmus Festival. We're going to have it next spring once again. Starmus 7, this is in Bratislava, Slovakia, which is just a stone's throw um, from Vienna, from Aus Vienna, Austria, the great European city. So we will look forward to all kinds of fun there at Starmus. We hope you can join us with 
Scott Roberts and his star party and an astrophoto school and many Nobel Prize winners and astronauts and some rock and roll from Brian May and friends as well. So that's all I have uh, tonight, Scott, for the, the bubble nebula. It's a, a joy to be back with you from Boston. Thank and you. Will, um, Thank you. Uh, and I, the, I'm going to add, you know, an essential tool, an essential tool of exploring your cosmos is Astronomy Magazine and all the great books made available by Dave Iker. Well, thank you, Scott. And a lot of the people that are on our programs, that, you know, of course, David Levy's another one who's written yes. a great book on there. And hiding in the back, backstage, just off the curtain, is Dr. Tim Hunter. And uh, he'll be talking about a new book that he came out with um, about, well, I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I mean, it's a tease, okay? <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, uh, but... Uh, uh, Tim, Tim has agreed to come on later in some weeks to talk about his new book. So. Excellent. We will all look forward to Tim's new book, no doubt. Absolutely. Thanks very much, David. We'll Thank talk you. To you later. Okay. Bye. So we are going to uh, bring on the president of the Astronomical League. And so that is Carol, uh, Carol Orge. And Carol is uh, one of the friendliest... Um, most engaging uh, individuals in our community of amateur astronomy. Uh, he travels all over the place attending different events and he's always pushing the envelope to um, get more and more people involved in amateur astronomy. He deserves like some sort of a Emmy or Oscar or something like that. But uh, Carol, thank you very much for coming on to Global Star Party. I'm not sure who you were talking about there, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> None other, none other than you. So. <laughs> Thanks for that wonderful introduction. We've got a great lineup of speakers tonight. It's good to see everybody here again. Yep. And I'm going to share my screen and talk about Astronomy Day, hopefully. Okay, you can see your PowerPoint. Outstanding. And presentation mode, perfect. Uh, Astronomy Day can be seen as a potential passport to a lifetime in astronomy. And uh, you may look at the object to my right and say, well, what is the connection to Stonehenge? That's a different era. Well, yeah, that's correct. However, Stonehenge, uh, I, I would uh, venture to say, was the original Astronomy Day. Here's the oldest known depiction of Stonehenge. Uh, in this uh, graphic here, a giant helps the mythical figure Merlin build Stonehenge. So the spirit of International Astronomy Day dates back to approximately 2800 BC, starting with Stonehenge. And Dave Iker may have a little different date on that. I'm not sure, but I think we're in the ballpark anyway. So what is Astronomy Day? And to the right of the screen is the latest advertisement for that event and the latest issue, the September edition of the Reflector. Astronomy Day uh, for the fall version is coming up within a month on September 23rd, 2023. That's a Saturday. And we encourage people from all over the world to get out and set up your telescopes and uh, engage the public and really tell them what astronomy is all about. And uh, the kids like to get around telescopes and we have to watch them sometimes, but that's our future. And we've really got to engage the younger generations as well as the uh, uh, other uh, people who have never looked through telescopes or been around astronomy. We get over the years have gotten submissions for Astronomy Day Awards from many different groups, including astronomy uh, societies, science museums, planetariums, and so on all activities to share the public, to teach the public what the local astronomy, the astronomy resources are in the facilities. And I would say uh, uh, on the bottom of that ad over there, you'll see the name Gary Thomason. Some of you know that person. He just announced his retirement after 40 years as the Astronomy Day coordinator. So he says, I need a rest. I need to pass the baton on. So 
We're very thankful for Gary for uh, serving that many years as head of that organization. What is Astronomy Day? It was a grassroots movement designed to share the joy of astronomy with the general public. That's a nice general phrase. And as we say, uh, uh, it's it's been going on for uh, many years, 40 years plus that the league has been actively involved. Back in the fall of 2022, actually September, I went to uh, the Minnesota Astronomical Society. Uh, I was up there uh, helping them celebrate their 50th year uh, of being an astronomy club. And just coincidentally, that was also Astronomy Day that weekend, and they put on quite a performance. Uh, if you look at the graphic there, the mock-up of Apollo 11 lunar lander, it's the first time I've seen something like that in Astronomy Day, and I've seen many of them. Uh, but the, they had an engineer in that club who uh, decided that he needed to set up a replica of the lunar lander for an Astronomy Day activity. And as a result, they uh, bring it out during their astronomy days, as well as other events of that club. And it's been real effective. Obviously, when you see that, it does get people's attention. And that was the whole purpose. He was very precise in how the uh, instruments were laid out uh, on the ground there. And it was just really a delight to see what ingenuity uh, that, uh, that person and the whole club actually exhibited for that event. Here's a picture of the observatory complex for that organization, and that's where they had their Astronomy Day activities. Uh, there's a reason it's called Eagle Lake. It's located on a lake, a very nice lake, and very picturesque. And I was there during the fall, very, very beautiful time of the year. And they uh, here was one of the exhibits there. Uh, at that point, uh, Observe the Moon Night was going to follow about a month or two after that, and they had a, a wonderful display on that. Another thing I found very fascinating, they had gravity buckets to illustrate the difference in gravity on the planets, and it was well thought out uh, by different, having different amounts of uh, 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 dirt, and each one, it gave an idea of what the difference is between the planets. Very effective, I thought. In fact, uh, since I've published some of this, uh, other clubs have latched onto this, thought that was a brilliant idea for their astronomy days. Also, uh, they had the typical planet size comparisons with different instruments, uh, the basketballs, uh, uh, baseballs, and so on. And going all the way to the left, Mercury was uh, depicted as being a very small rock in the uh, little jar there. While I was at that event, we also, as I said, helped them recognize their 50th anniversary that weekend, and it was a very nice experience. They spent the whole weekend celebrating 50 years and uh, throwing uh, uh, astronomy down on top of that, so it was a very busy weekend. But one of the things I would like to emphasize going back to the astronomy section, astronomy day section, is that Clubs or other organizations can exhibit a, lots of, a lot of creativity in how they present this to the public. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get people out, and that can take many forms, uh, just get out there and do it. And uh, the public uh, often sees none of this just at, in their normal lives, so it's really good to get out there and show them what's going on. So going on from here, I mentioned earlier that uh, Gary just retired, Gary Tomlinson, after 40 years with the as Astronomy Day coordinator. What uh, Right now, we're in the process. In fact, I've already appointed a new Astronomy Day coordinator, um, and he will be uh, at the helm very soon here. We're going to have a revision of the entire Astronomy Day program in progress. Uh, that That's in progress right now. And we continue to have the sponsorship with the Sky and Telescope and AAS. And here's the address, the uh, link to uh, submit entries for this event happening next month. I would encourage you to get out there and uh, see what you can set up with your uh, local community. It doesn't have to be the, the, the fanciest thing in the world, but it does. Uh, it is a good opportunity to get out and share astronomy uh, put your uh, solar telescopes out there and let the uh, uh, people 
uh, really uh, do some imbuing with uh, the well-shielded uh, telescopes. And that's it. And again, I want to encourage you to get out there and keep those submissions coming because that's what we like to see as we go forward. And Scott, now back to you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So um, our next speaker comes all the way from Chile uh, and other remote parts of the world. Uh, uh, Carrie Letelier is uh, uh, quickly becoming one of my favorite of all time night sky photographers. Uh, her uh, recent uh, images of, uh, was it Iceland is where you were, Carrie? Yes, it was in Iceland. Both photos, well, the, the Apple photos were both in there. Thanks, Incredible. Scott. I'm so happy to be here again. So much time that I haven't been joining this Global Star parties. So so nice to... You've been, to, You've been so, so busy. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's great. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. And uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't been to um, uh, Carrie's website, uh, you can go to our page at explorescientific.com forward slash GSP128 and you'll see her picture down there. We're gonna make a link later on straight to um, uh, her uh, profile and uh, you'll go to carrieletelier.com and see some images that will blow your mind. So they, uh, they, they come across well when she shares them here but to see them on your own screen like that is just it's fabulous. So here we go. Thanks, God. Thanks a lot. Well, um, about that, uh, about photography as a tool for develop for uh, for us, for develop of us as humans, is what I want to talk about. Let me just share my screen. Um, so. We all know that throughout the story, uh, various tools and inventions have significantly contributed to humanity's understanding of the universe. But photography played this pivotal role and in advancing our understanding of the universe by providing a new way to capture and analyze celestial phenomena. Here's, I, I want to show you and make this a very short journey about um, analyzing how um, understanding of the universe uh, by providing this new way to capture and analyze celestial phenomena uh, has helped humanity to gain new window into our understanding of the universe. So some of the points the, of this issue is that photography revolutionized astronomy by enabling the capture of faint and very and so distant celestial objects, right? Um, accurate and record keeping of transient events and the study of timeless distances, which I love them also. <laughs> and this facilitated the discovery of the stellar spectra, created comprehensive catalogs of celestial objects. So, how to name, uh, name them, right? And to guide about their names and about this celestial map that we have, and provide a detailed image of planets and moon. And well, in the other hand, we have composite image that has revealed this very faint and hiding uh, structures that we have in, in nebulas. And in the other hand, we have tools like, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope that produce iconic images advancing our understanding of the universe, evolution and complexity. So to start this journey, um, I wanted to start with one of the first astrophotographies in the story. That is this one, is a daguerreotype of the moon, right? It was made during 1840 by John William Dropper. Actually, this achievement marked an early step in astrophotography, showcasing the potential of photography for capturing celestial objects and contributing, right, to the development of this field. Um, I wanted to name you some facts about this image that is actually a composite image because droppers. Uh, he made two images for this. He two daguerreotypes plates for this 
one exposed for the very bright details of the moon surface, right? And another one exposed for the much dimmer details of the moon in illuminated portion. So there were more photos before this one of the moon, but this was like the very first one, very well exposed. Well, if we have the moon, we obviously need to talk about the first daguerreotype of the sun during um, uh, during uh, 1845, right? Made by Armand Fissot and Leon Foucault. This very first successful daguerreotype of the sun, you can also notice in there the dark spots, right? The techniques they use in here was the elastat and the device employ, uh, well, this device employ a rotating mirror that tracks the sun's movement across the sky and reflected the image into the camera. Well, this allowed the, these guys, these astronomers, for uh, to get a much shorter exposure time compared to the earlier attempts and trials that they had, resulting in a more clearer, a more detailed photograph of the sun's surface. After that, obviously, we have the sun. We need to talk about the first daguerreotype of a total solar eclipse during 1851 by Julius Berkowski. So the process that uh, Julius used in here was a length exposure time of 84 seconds. That means that the photograph captured the solar corona, right? We know that only during a total solar eclipse we can see the corona or also using special filters like the H-alpha. And by this way, we can see the other atmosphere of the sun. And in this case, also the surrounding stars that were so, so dim and so very faint were also um, uh, available to watch them in this daguerreotype. And actually, uh, this breakthrough mark make a significant milestone in astrophotography, allowing scientists to study the sun corona and contributing to our understanding of this uh, of the solar phenomena during eclipses. Actually, for example, I don't know if you knew, but with this photo, this eclipse generated such a, a widespread public interest and such a huge media coverage, leading the increasedness uh, leading the increase of awareness uh, among society, among the people, about astronomy and celestial phenomena. And also, there were advancements in spectroscopy, as some of the observers used prism to split the sunlight into the component colors, revealing the sun's spectrum. After this, we have the very first DSO photo, right? The deep sky object photo, the very first image of Orion Nebula made during 1880 by Henry Draper. And actually Draper uh, made an, an exposure time of 50 minutes to allow the sensitive photographic pl uh, plates to capture this very faint light. This was so amazing because this image revealed so many details that they were not aware about of uh, all the, the structure of the nebula showing the nebulous gas and the dust clouds where the meteors were forming. Actually, this marked a significant step, understanding the birth and evolution of stars, right? And with this, Henry Dropper was settling a legacy in his uh, work, uh, and he laid the foundation for the intersection of this amazing union about photography and astronomy. Obviously, I can't forget to talk about the first image of a comet. It was the comet Tebet, um, 1881, uh, three, made by Jules Janssen. And well, with this, he demonstrated the potential of photography to capture the dynamic and time-sensitive nature of comets. Actually, with this photo, uh, this allowed astronomers to study the comet appearance and the structure in more detail, providing many valuable insights onto the composition and behavior of these amazing celestial wonders that we actually have, uh, I guess, two comets uh, going into the solar system this uh, next year, right? And we all know this one, and we all know uh, we all love this one. This is the first image of Andromeda galaxy made uh, during 1888 by Isaac Roberts. And actually this pioneering- Maybe it's a relative, maybe it's a relative of mine. 
Yeah, no, yeah. No. <laughs> a very old uncle, no? <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. But you, you can I say it. If you say it, I, I, I can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this pioneering achievement marked a crucial moment for astrophotography, revealing this the immense scale of a structure of a distant sphere galaxy. Remember that in the beginning, the first uh, observations of Andromeda, uh, most astronomers in that beginning thought that it was a nebula, not a galaxy, right? Well, with this, they revealed this immense scale and structure of this sphere galaxy so far beyond our Milky Way, right? Our neighbor. And well, and this one is, I have a huge jump to this image that is just one of the, it's a screenshot from the footage that I'm pretty sure that it had to be so, oh, in there, the date is not correct because it's during 1969, right? That Neil Armstrong was the very first person and put a foot into the moon. But we know uh, at nowadays with all this, I don't know, maybe these trends of the flat air and trying to deny everything. I don't know why people uh, keep doing that kind of, of things um, and trends, but the concept of the first man in the moon is often associated with historical uh, uh, fiction rather than historical reality, right? And this is because of Jules Verne. He was the first one in thinking and writing a novel thinking of this thinking in a man having a journey into the center of the earth or actually like this one the, in his novel that he published during 1865 that it was called From the Earth to the Moon, right? But this is reality. The first human to set foot on the moon was Neil Armstrong, um, an astronaut part of the Apollo 11 mission during July 20, during, uh, the year 1969, right? He became the very first person. And we all remember that amazing quote that he, he gave after this, that was that this is one small step for man and one giant length for mankind, right? Well, staying into the space, we have that this one, I, I wanted to show it because it's the very first light of the Hubble, just trying to calibrate the equipments, uh, all the instruments, right, uh, during 1990. Uh, just with some stars because the very first photo I have it ahead, but I wanted to show this as a precedent. After this one, I wanted to show this other one that was the very inspiration for Carl Sagan, right? The, this is a very special photo for NASA because it was made during Valentine's Day, right? During February the 14th in 1990. And it's called the family portrait because we have uh, the photos of many of the members of this family called the solar system. We're still missing in there three of them. Well, it depends how you see it. But in here, uh, we can see Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Earth, and Venus. But sadly, Mars had little sunlight. Mercury was too close to the sun. And, well, Pluto, the dwarf planet, uh, it was too dim to... to that uh, distance. And a fun fact about this is that this photo, it was not part of the original plan, right? It was uh, actually an idea of, of the team of which Carl Sagan was a member, as he was a member of the Blue Jagger Imaging team at that time. And the idea that he had was to point in the spacecraft back towards to uh, its home to the air and with this is with what he got inspired right with the pebble jet that he was intent um depicting air on a scale never seen before actually i i always like to to read about the quote that uh, the very famous quote that carl sagan had about um getting inspired with this image right that i will just read few words of this girl that he says that's here that's home that's us I mean everyone you love everyone you know everyone you ever heard of every human being whoever was live out their lives 
you know what what gets i i always get very emotional when i read it so i can just um, now and returning to the hubble space telescope in here we have a part of the very first image that actually most of the astronomers of the time believed that these guys in mm -hmm. charge of pointing the hubble to some space empty uh, this empty space area was maybe uh, a waste of time but they trust in trying to capture the light of the galaxies right in this very very small area this l yellow shape area and may during 1995 and despite the risk the hubble was 10 days capturing images to this very uh, small portion and well this image uh it's a landmark, a landmark that the, in Hubble history, that this image displayed 10,000 galaxies that were both near and far, offering a glimpse into galaxies just. So, and over the years, uh, newer and improved images like the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and the Extreme Deep Field reveal even more of the universe hidden depths. Um, well, if I already named uh, the portrait family. I can't forget to name this other one made mm -hmm. by the NASA's Cassini spacecraft, right? The day the Earth is made. It's much modern, smart, uh, actual, but it, it also remembers us about mm -hmm. this inspiration of Carl Sagan that we have. And uh, it's here to remind us, right, the Earth's significance in the universe. And it's a tribute to this mission the Cassini mission, and also to Carl Sagan Pablo, that concept, inspiring all and our uh, awareness about our cosmic home. And just getting to the end, I swear, I will be very, very fast. And we can't forget to, to, to name this one, the very first image of a black hole, the one located, so that's my, my dog that also wants to be part of this presentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 2019 by the Evan Horizon Telescope. Let's remember what is the Evan Horizon Telescope. Um, that is this global collaboration of radio telescopes that work together to create a vir virtual earth size telescope, right? And they all synchronize to observe the same target simultaneously. That was the way we work. <laughs> That was the way the, the way everybody could right? Give me just one second. Okay. Okay. So uh, <laughs> and this collaboration was a huge shape to in this very first image of the black hole. Um, we know that it's approximately Navini and the login go Are you uh, is everything okay, Carrie? Yeah, is everything okay? It's just my dog that didn't want it to stop barfing. So sorry about that. Oh, it's just your boyfriend. dog. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw you go down I and I thought, oh no, something's no, like, I have I have three dogs. I, I, I have adopted three dogs, so yeah. sometimes it gets... They're very some... curious. They're very curious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they really wanted to be part of the presentation. Well, 7 p.m. And... the CST time, Dana Naveen. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, well, the last one is just 
to name that having uh, all this knowledge that we gain with the first black hole image, we have uh, made possible to have this first image of Sagittarius A, right? Um, at the first image of the black hole that we have in our galaxy. And this image provided visual confirmation of the black hole's event horizon, right? The, the point beyond with where nothing can escape, even the light, the, the, the light, right? This breakthrough affirmed Einstein's theory of general relativity and provided direct observational evidence of the existence of black holes. So nobody can deny it now, right? And also uh, it allowed astronomers to directly observe a phenomenon that was probably only theoretical. This is the main thing that we can reach uh, through photography, right? So from the first degradates that we, we already reviewed to the very far reaches of a space telescope image and even horizon telescope image that have reached uh, have unfold galaxies and build cosmic processes and deepen our understanding. These photos are not just visual marbles, they are tangible connections between our curiosity and the celestial, the celestial expanse, offering this very intimate view into the, uh, the greatness of the cosmos, right? As we peer through this cosmic window, we transcend limits, embrace them now, and further expand our horizon of our comprehension. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Carrie, it was very interesting to see so many historic uh, images back to back like that. So, um, I really enjoyed that. I had not seen the uh, the solar image. It was nice to get some historical uh, information about how newsworthy that was, you know, at the time. I'm sure all these images were shocking and really changed uh, people's view of their world, their universe, everything, you know, upon seeing them. Uh, another shot um, uh, was, um, the first time that the Earth was seen rising off of the uh, moon's horizon, you know, another amazing uh, experience um, for people. So, and there's going to be more and more of that kind of thing happening as we go along. So, yeah. That's another one that I definitely need to add to my presentation next. <laughs> right, right. Okay, all right. We have. Um, uh, Dr. Daniel Barth coming on next here. Uh, Daniel, are you uh, are you available? I am. You are. Okay. I am, and it's uh, it's nice. We're we're running a little early this evening, and that's great. So no, I am already. And um, when we're talking about the tools of astronomy, uh, one of the things that it kind of it's one of those things that we see all the time, but we don't pay attention to. And that's the fact that all of our big professional telescopes are reflectors. If you go to purchase a telescope, you go to buy a telescope and you say, hmm, I want to shop for a telescope. You have lots of options. You have uh, reflectors, you have refractors, you have Moxitovs, you have all kinds of different telescope designs. But when you go to large research telescopes or even very uh, relatively large amateur telescopes, they're all reflectors. And part of the reason we look back at that and we say, well, gee, how is that so? Telescopes started out as reflectors. And when Newton invented the first successful reflector, actually uh, James Gregory designed a successful reflector before Newton, but couldn't, he was a bad technician and couldn't find a shop to make the mirrors to his specifications. Uh, and Newton came out with the first reflector telescope, the one that we know as a Newtonian today. His mirror was made of metal. These mirrors, uh, we didn't really have good technology for glass mirrors until the 18, late 1850s. So all of these mirrors were essentially bronze, what they call a high tin bronze. They were about uh, two thirds 
uh, copper and one third tin, traces of arsenic and other. It was really it was not past the era of alchemy, metallurgy and alchemy. We're still pretty close in the uh, 1600s. And so they were making these mirrors out of special formulas because they needed a mirror that was relatively white. It wasn't tending toward the red like copper or toward the yellow like gold. They wanted it white like silver. And they also wanted a metal that was quite hard. They wanted to be able to grind it, you see. They wanted to be able to figure a mirror because they didn't have the technology to make a mold. And uh, grinding mirrors was grinding a true parabola. They knew about it, but they, they didn't know how to grind one. Most of the early mirrors were spherical and so subject to lots of aberration. So you wonder why uh, <clears throat> uh, they built telescopes with focal lengths, mirror telescopes with focal lengths of 40 feet. I was to get rid of some of the chromatic aberration that they, or excuse me, the uh, spherical aberration that they were seeing. Anyway, the technology for putting silver on glass was invented by a guy you probably heard of if you're a math person, Foucault. And uh, Foucault, uh, working with a fellow named Steinhill, which actually translates quite literally to hailstone. <laughs> Anyway, these two fellows invented a process for depositing silver on mirrors. Now, were the bronze, even at its best, about 66% reflective? Imagine if you came in and says, do my mirror need, need a new coating? It's only 66% reflective. We would think that was awful. Uh, what are you using? <laughs> you know, tinfoil wrappers off of gum? It would seem terrible, but that's what the standard was at the time. Silver gave you about a 90% reflectivity. So imagine going basically and you're collecting 50% uh, more light per aperture. So your eight inch performs more like a 10 or a 12 inch. Uh, it was a revolution putting silver on glass. Glass was even easier to figure and polish than metal was. And of course the technology for figuring glass lenses for eyeglasses had been around since the 1300s. So now we're talking 1850s, an era of glass working, understanding how to figure glass and the technology to deposit metal to make these things more reflective. Well, at this time, the 1850s, the refractor was still considered to be the instrument. And professional astronomers in the 1800s uh, around the world, pretty much, uh, certainly up to about the 1870s, the refractor was the thing because the alternative for a larger telescope with high resolution was a telescope with a massive metal mirror. Keep in mind that where you have uh, bronze has a density of about nine grams per cubic centimeter, Glass has a density of about two and a half. So bronze is many times more dense and a given blank for a given mirror is going to be what, four or five times heavier than its glass equivalent requiring, think about those of you who built telescopes, mounting a big mirror takes a lot of structural support. And when your mirror is made of bronze, uh, yeah, the support has to be massive. And so we get this, uh, this revolution with Foucault and Steinhale. And basically the last time anybody made a big metal mirror reflector was the great Melbourne telescope. It was a 48 inch instrument, which is indeed massive, built in 1867, uh, which is kind of sad because it's 10 years or more after the advent of silver on glass technology, but no. And after that, the Andrew Common Telescope in England, 1879, uh, a 36 inch reflector. And remember that the Yerkes, the largest, basically a one meter refractor is the largest ever built. And refractors anywhere over 50 centimeters are incredibly rare. Um, and they're really difficult. Uh, after that, 1908, we have the Mount Wilson telescope, the 60 inch, the hooker, the 100 inch comes on in 1917. And of course, 1948, 
we get Palomar. And we think about these things and we go, wow, you know, this is, this is amazing. And of course we have other technology now too. Mercury mirrors, uh, these crazy things where you take a pool of mercury and you spin it. Sometimes large mirrors themselves are spin cast where you will heat a glass slug into a molten blank and then the furnace spins to create that perfect parabolic shape. Uh, and we think about all of these things. The back of a glass mirror can be a hexagonal honeycomb to reduce weight. But the real thing that killed the refractor, my friends, is the idea that a glass lens through which light passes must be perfect throughout its volume and on the inner and outer curved surface. That's two perfectly figured curved surfaces and a perfect volume with no ripples, no distortions, no bubbles, no sleeks, no contaminants. For a glass mirror, we simply don't care. We're just going to figure the first surface top of it. And then, of course, the modern technology is aluminum and aluminum alloys. We vapor deposit this now. We also have coatings. But even silver mirrors could take uh, a coating to protect them. But metal mirrors, bronze cannot. These old metal mirrors, they had to be repolished every time you wanted to go on an observing session. And because polishing was abrasive, think Brasso, right? Mm. <laughs> well, every yes. so often, the massive mirror had to be refigured. So glass was the way and reflectors were the way because refractors beyond a certain size are just really uh, increasingly difficult to make and terribly, terribly expensive. So there we go. Next time you go out and look at your humble daub, you know, gee, there's, there's a lot of science there. Foucault's there, Steinhale's there. Uh, of course, Newton is there. We remember it as a Newtonian, but there's a lot more people than that who got us our modern reflector telescopes. Great. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, I will be um, moving on to uh, young Navin uh, Sinthil Kumar, who uh, has been uh, patiently waiting in the background there. Navin, um, uh, your program tonight is going to be on uh, Spacecraft, as I recall. Space flight. Um, hi, everyone. The first thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen. And can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So my presentation is called The Basics of Space Flight. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the one of the most important things. It, it's um, science payload. Um, there are a lot of ki different kinds of scientific instruments. And this is primarily about the uh, cutting-edge scientific innovations that NASA has created over the years. So there's many kinds of scientific instruments. And they're designed, built, and tested by teams of scientists who work at institutions around the world and to deliver them to a spacecraft before it's launched. Once they deliver it, they are integrated with the spacecraft and the tests continue with other subsystems to verify their commands as it function as expected. The telemetry flows back from the instruments, its power, thermal, and mechanical properties are within the limits. After launch, the same scientists who created an instrument may operate it in flight through cl close cooperation with the rest of the flight team. So all this, we're going to talk about Voyager, Cassini, Galileo, and these are many of NASA's cutting edge satellites. And these, and many of these are, are NASA's earliest innovations of the technology we still use and we still use today. And the first thing is direct and remote sensing instruments. Um, this one is from Galileo. 
So direct sensing instruments, also called contact science instruments, register characteristics of phenomena in their immediate vicinity. So in this example, it's Galileo's heavy ion counter is a direct sensing instrument. It registers the characteristics of ions in the spacecraft vicinity that actually enter the instrument. It does not attempt to form any image of the ion source. Both Galileo and Cassini each carry dust detectors. They measure properties such as mass, species, speed, and direction of dust particles, which actually enter the instrument. They do not attempt to form any image source of the dust. So you see down here is the Galileo heavy ion counter part of it. This is with one section of it right here, 2028 AA1. The left segment and then the right segment is 2028 A1. They both are the same thing. They're just different segments. And then the next thing is active and passive instruments. Um, most instruments only receive and process existing light particles or other phenomena, and they are said to be passive. The typical of this type would be an imaging instrument viewing a planet illuminated by sunlight or a magnometer measuring existing magnetic fields. An active instrument provides its own means of sensing the remote object. Typical of this would be a radar system that we all know of. Radar generates pulses of radio waves that it sends to a surface and then receives the reflections back from the surface to create images or deduce characteristics of the surface. Um, radar, you can see that on a lot of things. Um, that's like the earliest version. Some radio science experiments um, described in the chapter eight of the book, of uh, the article, sorry, are also examples of active sensing since they send radio energy through a planet's atmosphere or rings to actively probe the phenomena, with the results being directly on Earth being received. And the next thing we're going to go to is some examples. The first thing is high energy particle de detectors. This is all on Voyager, all on NASA's Voyager satellite. High energy particle detector instruments measure the energy spectrum of trapped energetic electrons, the energy in the composition of atomic nuclei. They may employ several independent solid state detector telescopes. The cosmic ray subsystem CRS on the Voyagers measures the presence and angular distribution of particles from the planet's magnetospheres and from sources outside our solar system. Electrons of 310. MEV and new Sorry, I didn't catch that. Could you repeat your calculation? Sorry, guys, it's Alexa. <laughs> I'm being annoying. All right, let's just keep going on. Um, going. Three, 310 MEV and nuclei, 1,500 1, MEV from hydrogen to being converted to iron. The energetic particle detector EPD on Galileo is sensitive the same nuclei with energies from 20 keV to 10 mega eV. So this is Voyager. Voyager is a very cutting edge satellite that NASA builds. And all of this innovation is all in the 70s, which is pretty impressive what NASA did then. Um, I think the Voyagers are still being used. Um, so the next thing is also on Voyager. It's called the low energy charged particle detectors. A low energy charge particle detector, LECP, is a mid-range instrument designed to characterize the composition, energies, and angular distributions of particles, charged particles in interplanetary space within planetary systems. One or more solid state particle detectors may be mounted on a rotating platform. The Voyager's LECPs are sensitive from around 10 keV or up into the lower ranges of cosmic ray detector. Ulysses LECP is similar and is named GLG for its principal investigators, Glockler and Geiss. I think that's what you say. And then this is like Voyager's technical diagram. So Voyager, for example, has a lot of these instruments on there. And you can see a spectrometer on there. There's a lot of stuff on Voyager. And then the next thing is planetary radio astronomy instruments. Planetary radio astronomy instrument measures radio signals emitted by a target such as hobby and planet. The instrument on Voyager is similar 
is sensitive to signals between 1 kilohertz and 40 megahertz and uses a dipole antenna around 10 meters long, which it shares with the plasma wave instrument. The planetary radio astronomy instrument detected emissions from Helipus in 1993. You could see the illustration in chapter one. Ulysses carries a similar instrument. Um, Voyager and Ulysses are very like similar and like they're, they're um, related to each other. They're related satellites and many of the instruments they have are, are a lot in common. Um, imaging instruments. An imaging instrument uses optics such as lenses and mirrors to protect an image onto a detector, which is converted to digital data. A lot of natural color imaging requires taking three exposures of the same target in quick succession through different color filters. Different. Typically, they're all from filter wheel. Earth-based processing combines data from the three black and white images, reconstructing the original color by utilizing the three values of each pixel. Picture on pixels. Movies, for example, are produced by taking a series of images over an extended period of time. In the past, the detector created the image was a vacuum tool <clears throat> resembling a small CRT cathode ray tube called a video con. In a video con, signals applied to deflection coils and focus coils sweep an electron beam from a heated cathode, an electron source, across the photoconductor coating inside the type's glass front where the image is focused. Um, this is just a diagram of the Mars 2020 rover and on what instruments this has. Um, and then just the la one of the last ones, synthetic aperture radar imaging. Some solar object system objects are that are candidates for radar imaging are covered by clouds or haze, making optical imaging difficult or sometimes impossible. These atmospheres are transparent to radio frequency waves and can be imaged using synthetic aperture radar, SAR, which provides its own penetrating illumination with radio waves. SAR is more, more a technique than a single instrument. It uses hardware and software as most instruments do. But it also employs the motion of the spacecraft in orbit. SAR synthesizes the angular resolving power of an antenna many times the size of the antenna aperture actually used. Last but not least is an altimeter. A spacecraft's altimeter sends coded radio pulses or laser light pulses straight down to a planet's surface, the natter, to measure variations in the height of the terrain below. The signals are timed from the instant they leave the instrument until they are reflected back. And the round trip distance is obtained by dividing the speed of light and factoring in known equipment processing delays. Dividing by two then approximates the one way distance between the instrument and the surface actual terrain height is deduced based upon knowledge of the spacecraft's orbit. And this is an altimeter. It's on an airplane. It's on everything. Well, that's all my presentation is. Um, thanks. And that's all. Thank you, Nevin. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, we will uh, go to back down to Argentina to uh, Maxi Filares um, and uh, uh, to um, talk about uh, his uh, recent astrophotography. Maxi? Hello, guys. How's it going? I was in the background, but I was listening. And Kerry, congratulations first. You know, uh, for our region, you are the top, you know, I think. And congratulations for the APOD and the, the cover of the National Geographic magazine. And, of course, the images that you capture of the, uh, well, auroras are outstanding. So... My for, applause, la verdad, te felicito, Flaca, ¿qué quieres te diga? <laughs> Thanks, Maxi. Hope to have you on one of my expeditions to hand off the lights. Well, I, I hope I hope someday, you know, uh, but I do more deep sky objects. So if I will have auroras, I, I think uh, that will be a challenge. So, well, 
what I'm going to show you what I was doing this past uh, weekend. I was preparing again the, the equipment to do some planetary pictures of Saturn because we had the opposition of uh, the ring planet. So let me share my screen. Um, okay, do you see it? Yes. Great. So I, uh, first of all, uh, I was still, uh, you know, when you do astrophotography, you're still processing. And in this case, I was doing some pictures of Jupiter too. But first of all, I want to show you what I was doing. Uh, yeah, the, that's here. Uh, do you remember this is the, the equipment that I was uh, taking on, the, the F6? A eight inches telescope and uh, this is my my backyard and we had a really good night that uh, it was luckily it was clear sky but a uh, kind of windy but anyway i i tried to give a shot on that and i was first of all uh, practicing with some uh, videos of, on the moon you know let me do you see this video? You know, you can see the the wind and the 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 the, the atmosphere going to very crazy. But anyway, I this was only a few seconds. So for a little short time, we had a very good um, scene. So to do moon surface or planets it will help you to to get some details because you stack the better uh, pictures of that video so you can uh, select them also this this was a uh, only cropping a, a place uh, of the, the, the field of view but then i put the 3x uh, barlow so for example this was uh, from Plato Crater, and you know you can see these mountains there. They are amazing. So I give a chance to stack this, and this was the the results that I get for that for that night of the surface of the moon surface, and I was really happy for the little short time of videos, and. Anyway, I could get details of the crater and the, the mountains there and also in other places. Uh, for me, it was outstanding. And the another one was this. Uh, I think I, yeah, this one. No, sorry, it was the, the another here. No, this is without the, the Barlow lens. So in this case, uh, this part is, uh, I remember, or I think it was the the lady of Cassini that he drew on the map of the moon at that time to mm -hmm. get honor to her love uh, uh, wife. And well, then I... The Saturn is coming rise up. Uh, luckily, we had it almost 75 degrees here uh, of altitude. So that's really good for planetary, you know, any kind of photography, because uh, the the atmosphere, it will help you or will not. So I did a lot of videos of uh, 90 uh, seconds and then process them a uh, put on group of a uh, uh, 10 videos every each other so then i derotated and then i stacked them and everything that you have to do in hours uh, so the final results let me find the, the images I think it was this, yeah, because I put it uh, upside down, depends of the 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 perspective of, of where you are, 
but uh, for example, I think there was this. Yeah, this is one That's of that night. You know, I was really uh, low in mind of the rings that they are. They were really shining, and I see, and I think it calls. This has a an visual effect that calls. Well, I I don't remember how it calls. Sorry. Um, this is more uh, beyond, and I could get you know details of the of the Cassini division, uh, storms, and I couldn't get because a, a transit of Enceladus it was passing by, but in the videos I I, I didn't know why I couldn't get it. Nico has it. Unfortunately, he he's not with us tonight. Uh, this is the, the another perspective of this uh, field of view. Um, you know, I love to do Saturn, and I I can still believe that in twenty twenty five in in two years, the rings going to be very horizontal. So it was it will going to be almost difficult to watch it. So then we start to see the, the southern part of the planet. So this is what I was doing with Saturn. And then I tried to give a chance to capture Jupiter. But uh, unfortunately, here in Argentina, we have it almost at the maximum 40 degrees above the, the horizon. So um, anyway, I say uh, it's. It's not too late. I can try it and do some videos. So I was, uh, I, I did all these videos, almost one hour, uh, one and a half hour of videos, uh, thinking of uh, Jupiter. And you know, the, the better one was the last ones, for example. Uh, here's a, a little, stack a single stack that I get you can see the the movement that I'm clicking on here on mm -hmm. in only 10 or 11 minutes uh, that you can see the, the the rotation so I process this I'm still working on it but anyway I want to show you what I get and this is was uh, I think most finally a picture of Jupiter of that regular night uh, so for to get this result I'm happy you know <laughs> anyway anyway of the, the the weather conditions and the, uh, uh, the the stabilization of the atmosphere and everything I don't care I love to I have the the gray red spots I see a lot of storms in the uh, in the northern place and the, the southern. And anyway, I'm I'm really happy. Of course, I will be glad if I will get more detail. But anyway, I'm I'm really really happy for this. So uh, I will still working on it. I I am still practicing. Uh, talking a, a lot with Nico and other persons about this or how to process or what I could do or what I could do. And, you know, it never ends. You never stop to learn. So, and well, I I think that this was all for tonight. It was a really short presentation. I hope that you liked it. And uh, of course, if you want to, to follow me on my social networks, it's AstroMax, okay? in Instagram, or you can find me in Facebook page, Maxi Falieres. And, and of course, if you want to ask me something or talk about something, if I could give you the answer, I will. Uh, so if I will not, let's, uh, we, we can find the, the answer together. So thanks for tonight and continue with the GSP. Okay, well, thank you so much, thank you so much Maxi. Maxi. Wonderful. Thank you. And, um, uh, if you would put the uh, put your link in the chat, and I will yes. put it on to, or or uh, you could uh, put it directly into the YouTube chat. But I I wanted to share it to all the different uh, 
uh, yes, yes, I, I, I would social do. media channels there. So, all right, uh, guys, we are going to take. Um, we're Actually, going to take a Scott, I was hoping to get a quick. My presentation is going to be quicker than Maxi because, as you can see, there is a game that will start a in a few game. minutes. <laughs> yeah, I am. Okay. All right. You want to go on? And, uh, what I, before I do my game, I wanted to quickly okay. share with the folks, um, right. maybe share a picture, but it'll just be really quick. I'm going to let everybody know that when I'm not out playing baseball and I'm out um, or working, that I'm out at uh, Dark Sky Parks. Yeah. And oftentimes we talk about the equipment. I know the Global Star Party's talked about the tools that we use. And in some cases, it doesn't take a lot of tools. For me and my pictures, I have a, an old DSLR camera that's 12 years old, a Canon 6D. I use a star tracker that's fairly small. It's called a move, shoot, move. You've heard of some other star trackers. And I use a tripod. My lens is a, is a wide angle lens. Sometimes I use a more narrow angle or a zoom. But, and that's pretty much it. And I'll show one image before we go to break. Um, let's see. I think I can get it out of photos. Yeah, here we go. Um, pictures that you can take with your iPhone. Let's see if this will work. So this used none of the uh, imagery that, uh, or none of the equipment that I use. I used my iPhone composed and ended up with this shot using wide angle. If you're out there, you just use your iPhone and uh, you're fine. Now, there are some things you must use equipment with. And uh, really quickly, let me share my screen and start it. And I'll show you a type of picture that you that is very difficult to do with. If it'll work. If not, then we'll just, let's see. I have sharing screen. Okay, cool. Let's do this. Let's do this. And now you should be able to see some other pictures that you cannot do. And we'll use this one as an example. Are you able to see it, Scott, the uh, moon? Yes. Yeah, this is the sort of picture that Try it with an iPhone if you want. It's dusk. It's darker. There's not as much light that you can do this sort of these sort of pictures with. So some of these things do require panoramas. Do require and sunsets. Sometimes do require that you have at least a DSLR. So those are the pictures that you know, just doing that. And of course, before I forget if you want to do milky way photography you should probably use a dslr as uh, this picture shows this is very hard to do with an iphone so those of you that are um let's see i don't know which way this is pointing but uh let's just say if you are attempting to do and i'll stop to share here if you are attempting to do your imaging, there are certain things you can use your um, iPhone for. There are certain things you just simply cannot. And so with that, Scott, that is my presentation. Okay. Uh, get the most out of your equipment by continuing to use it. Don't fall for the, I got to have this in order to take great pictures. Right. You just have to have a process by which you take it. Long exposures. Play around with the other settings till you get pictures you want and then expand from there. And that is how you do it. So now the tools I'm about to go use involve a ball and a bat and hopefully not breaking my leg. So wish me luck and get out there and enjoy the sky when it's clear. Sounds good. All right. Sounds good. Thanks very much. All right. So um, at this moment, we will take uh, uh, some minutes uh, and come back. Um, and uh, uh, since we already have had our presentation from Adrian, uh, we will go to Cesar Brollo down in Argentina. So um, stay tuned.
Okay, guys, we are back. Um, thanks for letting us take a little short break there. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Cesar Brollo. Cesar has uh, been involved in uh, with telescopes and optics manufacturing for many years, and um, uh, he has, uh, uh, runs a, a shop, a telescope shop called um, Optica Soraco in uh, Buenos Aires, and um, uh, he is also involved in the restoration of a historic uh, observatory complex in Argentina. Uh, you can often find him uh, looking off into the skies from his balcony uh, in Buenos Aires as well. And um, anyways, I'm going to bring on Cesar. Are you ready to come onto the program? Good night. Everyone, uh, yes, ever, ever, ever uh, I am ready. <laughs> ever, ever, I'm ready. All right. But, okay. but uh, as as is um, normal, uh, it's not totally cloudy, but it's foggy. Um, foggy. We have full moon tonight. Yes, it's right. not foggy. It's exactly, it's like like it's more. It's the the kind of of uh, clouds that looks like. Uh, like a uh, smoke, you know. I and see. let me <laughs> let me share because I can show you. And since I can we're show you. Hey, uh, you, you know you know that every ever I have for you <laughs> stars. <laughs> yes. Let me let me check if I can because my idea is see. The doubly Brigio Centauri, but maybe it's impossible to 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 have a a difference between because I have a great focus, but maybe the diffraction, you know, something something is that I can you can see the the clouds that as normally my presentations that this is the area of of Frigil Kentauros something that well I I can talk about tools uh, Scott because I yeah. use my tools live <laughs> yes um the area where I can avoid that I am avoiding my my tool my telescope it's um it's up to Richard Centauri or Alpha Centauri, the, the brightest star of Centauri, is an area full of stars. And uh, I can show you in this area. Let me show you maybe with a map to have an idea to the audience. I'll change. Let me open in Stellarium for us. Alpha Centauri is a, is a double star, but actually mm -hmm. it's not easy to, to make a difference between. So it looks like there's a little bump. Yes. Of the uh, star. I don't know if that's, yes. if that's the double star or not. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think that, let me check if I can share the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're switching between programs, you may have to unshare and then. Yes, 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 I, I, I did. Yes, but I am preparing the Stellarium. Oh, right. Uh, yes, with the, you know, with the, with the 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 um, only I need to to sh to to show the ad audience the area and I I yes of course that I'll stop share the live image and I'll share Stellarium the sky map my telescope is pointing here but maybe we can.
I see. In the same, yes, it's the same. <laughs> to live with the bride. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to, I, we have the same, the same problem like in the map. It's too right to, to make a separation for the CCD, but we can try, we can try. And let me, we can, we can go to this cluster. We return to the telescope image. Let me see what it is. Is, uh, how, how yes, many, tell me. How many people are now buying this small kind of uh, uh, telescope system for home use at, at this point in, in your area? Is that is it popular or do people want large Dobsonians or what, what is it that they are they're typically buying? It's a, to it's a total, total mix of different different uh, telescope. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have, uh, a, you know, I know people with a uh, uh, Schmidt Kassegrain. Uh, of course, that the Schmidt Kassegrain is the lowest number because the cost is higher. But mostly of the people in Argentina use. Um, 130 millimeters and 150 millimeters. Mm -hmm. The most uh, um, F5, X, F5, the, the focal ratio. Um, uh, and uh, of course that, um, here I'm trying to, to, to while we are talking, <laughs> I'm yeah. trying to, to take the idea which is the Dracula cluster. This is this, this area. I like the name, that's cool. Yeah, Dracula, yeah. That's a little scary, <laughs> but you know. Sure, where is exactly? But it's a rich uh, part of the sky, you know. Sorry, but, but reflections of another life, like pollution, you know, we are appointing near to the, to the building and we have some reflection of the light it's mm -hmm. not the best the best situation to to watch by telescope but it's, it's great okay and is great you know it's a live image <laughs> it is a live image. maybe the it, i think that this is the this open cluster because it's not a globular cluster i see and you have some some different colors And why no. why is it called the Dracula cluster? I've never I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Mostly imagination in the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was from Czechoslovakia, perhaps, or Transylvania. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe and um, of course that that you know we can think that can be this or can be this. Maybe our asterism here are, is, this is interesting too. Let me move the telescope a little. Not that. Sorry. I love more <laughs> use a live telescope than, you know. Than the big one. Yes, or the big one, or or have only processed pictures, because it's the magic of oh, that. Yeah. And you know that we are we are making a searching, live searching. You know that. If it is going to be in this area, we can we can try if um, I can see something. I can see. It looks like we can also see clouds a little yes. bit. Yes. Ah, yes. Sorry that every ah. time that 
I have, I have, yes, I have an excellent pronostic. I, I in the water report, we yeah. have like a without clouds. In any any moment, I see that we are clouds waiting. are part of the program usually, right? <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> you know this is part of. You have reason, John. Sorry that I I I, I couldn't listen to you. Earlier. Yeah, <laughs> I show for you. They this is up. part. Actually, in the last week was part of the program. John, yes. it was part of the <laughs> yes, You're yes. lucky we, we had a hurricane here. Yes, but... in the past, the people told me, that, uh, uh, do you remember, Scott, uh, 100 miles per hour by the wind, uh, yes. Caesar, and actually it's the cloudy, cloudy Caesar. I don't know. It's cloudy Caesar now. Yes, yes. No, no, no. We, we, we need you know, more lucky. But one, no, no, one thing we, I can we, tell you, and for all of you that are listening out there, okay, is that um, when you do presentations, you know, you're doing outreach presentations and stuff, uh, you know, it's it's something where uh, if, if I'm being asked to go out, of course, a lot of people are going to expect, oh, Scott's got telescopes, we're going to do astronomy, we're going to yes. see something in the sky that's amazing and if i promise that people are going to see something almost always if i promise it's going to come over okay so <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. absolutely so i i like to give a presentation and talk about you know why uh we're into astronomy why why um you know uh, that that we're passionate about it and what it is that we're learning on a personal on a deeply personal level you know, because, yes. we're, you know, I, you know, I don't want to be tongue in cheek about this or, you know, I don't know if you. Yeah, it, it some gives people you get the that ability. Idiom, you know, that's an American idiom, tongue in cheek. But uh, but uh, uh, the uh, the point is, is that if we are made of star stuff, if we are here and alive on this planet because of the conditions of the entire universe, okay, then um, just just waking up in the morning and peeling back your eyes and looking at the sunrise um, and just going about your normal day, which might not feel very special, but it is unbelievably special. It is incredibly special, you know, that, that we have this uh, ability and, um, you know, amateur astronomers kind of wake up to this. They, uh, they uh, sometimes they like all of us. I mean, we go about our normal, average, everyday life. I'm, I'm saying average, but there is nothing average about it. It is just a almost a, a, a miracle that we're able to breathe all the complex gases in our atmosphere and say that that's a breath of air um, for us to, uh, you know. Uh, to live in an environment that we live in. It's just, it's, it, it just blows my mind sometimes. And Absolutely. you start looking at the connections that we all have uh, with everything. And, uh, you know, and then you have these, you know, we're animals, you know, a lot of people don't think we're animals, but we make these tools so that we can explore our environment. And our environment goes as far as you can see into space. Um, it, go, it goes as far as our, the tools that we can use to detect what's out there, and that includes what amateurs can do. Um, I mean, look at Caesar here. He's jumping back and forth between a, a star map, an electronic star map on his computer. He's switching uh, uh, to live views through his telescope, and he's broadcasting live all over the world right now. And, yes. Um, you know, Scott, actually, actually, I don't know why, but is this open cluster is more like a, an, an asterisk on the, the cluster. I see. And watching the, the, the complexion of, of the stars, I show you again. <laughs> this is the, the idea of this. And of course that you tell the, 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 uh, to the audience the thing that looks simple, but is at the, was a long, a long way in technology, you I, I work 
but by most of 30 years yes uh, in this industry and this one in 30 years ago made the same that we are making tonight was impossible it was Look, impossible. you're right yes absolutely we are watching we are watching a non processing image a live image yes this is the this is the cluster this is the cluster why the name is dracula we don't know. We don't know. In fact, <laughs> don't I'm know. looking on the internet right now. Yeah. Why it's called Dracula, and I don't know. Why. Yes. It counts on you, Caesar. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, maybe to make it, it more popular or something. Who knows? Um, yes, yes, and, and this is um, uh, I I know people actually uh, uh, professional astronomers that are very interested in study open clusters because they know that the it's very interesting the condition um the, the interactivity between the stars of the open clusters because it's very interesting um how they have in open space mm -hmm. uh, not they are not globular clusters and have an very interesting structures of gravity or um and their you know their type of uh in the in the hhr diagram how many many um open clusters have uh no no expected stars in in the in the in the growth um the the interactivity between the stars is something that many astronomers actually are working on in the open clusters mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. sometimes open cluster you know are okay i can use an an, an eyepiece of you know <laughs> 40 uh 35 40 millimeters and yeah. you can start to to watch this open clusters um it's something to 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 study very it's very interesting here i don't know but sometimes i can see more stars depend in, you know you can see john john can yeah. say that you can see the the clouds the, the foggy clouds are not the same clouds that that in the last presentations so with, with some shape tonight is something like a like a smoke and i yeah, hate like them very thin that inversion <laughs> layer perhaps mm -hmm. oh, maybe. yes 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 it's maybe, maybe you know los angeles mm -hmm. yeah yes when you have the humidity it gets capped off it's very interesting well i want to say this is a city that it's um that it's uh, very near very near uh to the big river or estuario that is a river de la plata is so big that you you can't see the another coast in another coast is uruguay another country mm -hmm. we have 60 kilometers about 40 miles 40 miles uh the the, the size of the river and here of course that it will it's making a lot of humidity change in the in the in the weather when you say okay we don't have maybe we we don't have a cloud tonight no you have um of course that that is uh, uh last week we are we are sailing in the river and uh, the friend um trying a new a new sailboat and <laughs> say it's so big and it's it's crazy because it's big, but it's very shallow. Very maybe sometimes you have two meters deep. That's it. So yeah. Walk across. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sometimes you have you have <laughs> twenty meters, but in many many parts you 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 uh, took took the you you knock with the with the channel the oar, with the paddle. Yeah. Yes, but it's a big a big estuario of of fresh water 
I said the color of the water would have sediments is a brown color, uh, like a lion color. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's something that is unexpected, uh, changing the time every every time. But tonight is, you know, yeah. Um, okay, we we made something. We watched a, a, a open cluster, Dracula. Um, maybe with fog and a foggy night, blue moon have sense to see a Dracula cluster. Yes, Dude, that's in Centaurus too. So that's a southern. You know, you have to be low on the horizon, right? Yeah, that's right. John Ray is so, watching on Facebook. He says, wonderful. Argentina and all of us are fortunate to have Cesar spreading the science of astronomy. So thank you. Oh, thank you I so much. I have a question for you, Cesar. Uh, you know, since yeah, tell me. you know about the tools of astronomy, what is the setup? I mean, if, if I was a beginner and I don't know how to set up a telescope such as the one you have set up there. What What's your process? How, how do you get set up for the for the night? Yes, first of all, I, I can say that, uh, and especially for, for starters, for, for beginners in, in astronomy, they can choose sometimes, um, for example, my, my setup have an, let me show you. There we go. Sorry, I, I, I'll move a, a little uh, ah, here. Okay. Yeah. Here, this is the, the, the quadrilateral mound. This is very important to track the stars or have something. Uh, in the go to mounds are today uh, are very, very popular. This is a small and very, very smart uh, go to mound. And, but if you if you uh, need to start and for example here in Argentina that, that this kind of months for starting are not so cheap like a, like a single tripod you can start for example in explore scientific you can find the first light uh, first light um, a series of explore scientific where you can have a very simple Alta Simut mold, mm -hmm. where you can use uh, the first the first steps with a, a great optics, and you can you can uh, choose something where the the optical tube is the first is the starter, and many uh, mostly of the optical tube in the first light series, for example, for, for Explore scientific have the same the same uh, big same uh, dovetail yeah for the entire series and maybe the first year you can use um, refractor Maxuto uh, without a go to um, yes. without a go to mount you can use the cell phone with a with a uh, map. To start to know the star, the the stars, the position of, of this in the sky, and for the second year you can buy the the mount, only the mount, okay, and put together your optical tube that you have from from the your first light telescope, and make a more efficient uh, telescope like a small observatory. Here, of course, that I, I use a apochromic, a apochromic uh, telescope, very small but high-end optics. Triplet, triplet. But, and it's and um, actually I use something that is very interesting that I change. Maybe you you can see. Let me show you. For example, <clears throat> in the city, uh, I I put a. Uh, an upgrade of a bigger size finder or guider because I need to see more stars when I I'm guiding with a camera uh, making to the to the mount the precise tracking of the star for photography but for example tonight I need another thing I need to see if I have inside the field of vision 
the object that I can show you to the audience. And I prefer to, to use this like a finder. Today, you have a lot of different things to change. Um, it's, a, it's a time where you can choose your mount, your optical tube, your, fa your uh, uh, finder or guider, and you can arm like a Lego your, your different setup. And maybe not, uh, I prefer uh, for, for the people um, uh, but in my experience, uh, try to have small telescope, very teles very telescope, uh, transportable that you can you can bring in your your trips or something small that you can put complete uh, assembly in your backyard balcony. Um, the 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 try that that tonight we have is that I can show you a, a very fine open cluster with the same, maybe with the same condition of a bigger telescope, of a bigger telescope. And, uh, but, you know, you have a small setup that you have, if you don't have play, a, a open place or, or a big space to put an instrument, this is a, a, a a, a great real solution, but you can you can uh, mix, for example, this mount and a small uh, mount. It is the like X100 with a different kind of telescope and a small Maxutov and a chroma chromatic uh, telescope. Um, it, uh, today we are talking that Scott, you you asked me about which, which, uh, which is the the most uh, popular yes, telescope in Argentina. Yes, yes. New, new, most Newtonian, Newtonian, Newtonian um, of, of uh, for five or six inches. I see. Focal ratio five, um, uh, and uh, but but uh, the actually. The connection for the not the first level, the first level uh, amateurs, if not the second level, the, the level where um, not so starter. You know, when you go to choose your second telescope, you are going to buy an uh, uh, apochromic optical tube, for example. But if you if you are more interested, like Nico, in visual. Um, make a, but especially in visual, of course, that they are going to find a, a Dobsonian. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, I started different. with the Dobsonian telescope. Yes, it, it's the same like in the past. Yes, uh, and I think that that the tools was changing a lot. Um, Today that we are talking about the favorite tools. Um, today, the the small observatories are totally crazy thing because we are using every time more a pocket telescope for for uh, conditions to, to to watch something that are incredible because maybe if if we are um, watching like tonight and a small cluster or uh, three weeks ago the omega omega uh, giant cluster that is a, a a seed of an all very old galaxy uh, 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 it's it's magic it's incredible and we are not you can see the clouds and we have actually i have i have uh, some image it's incredible and um, this is something that that it's part of the magic of the technology that you can have. Uh, for example, you can have planetary planetary cameras that uh, you can use for deep uh, deep sky uh, image. And this is something that ten years ago was totally impossible to understand. 
And actually, they started to choose uh, back illuminate, back illuminate, and, and chips, CCDs, mm -hmm. and sensors with more a bigger with a bigger size of each pixel. And this was the 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 great the the, the great deal. The, the this changed totally totally the 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 game. Yeah, it was a and game changer. We absolutely, game changer. and yeah, the 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 of course that the, the cell phone, the cell phone, how the cell the cell phone. Well, this is uh, this is how I use my my mom for the audience because maybe the the, the, the people that know this mom. I Safari. But, uh, no, no, no. This is a proprietary software, a free software for the the Exos one hundred. Oh, it's a, it's a, a, a it, it's something that that where you have uh, uh, the total control and you have for example let me show you if I can uh, for example I can go here here you have a catalog Messier and you have it's very 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 just click click on the object you want to see and it goes right to it from your cell phone yes absolutely That's amazing. Boy, who would have yes. thought? <laughs> yes, yes. Look That's that. really cool. Of course, that, that, I, I put M egg, but M egg is, is, <laughs> is in the clouds now. It's in the clouds. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. It's pointing at it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. But if you had an infrared, very... you could see through the clouds with the infrared. Absolutely. Camp. Absolutely. And, 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 and this is something that how many, how many things you can see, and this is something, the tools that that today we have to to enjoy the astronomy from our backyards or, you know, are totally something that if I can show show to myself, if I can treat, I, I can be a, tra a time traveler yeah. and show to me or you, Scott, when you remember, but, Maybe, maybe with technology, no many, no a lot of years, 20 years, you know, yeah. in the time of, of 25 years, in the time of, of the LX200 that... Yes, I remember the, all of this the, starting. Yes, yes but the, the CCDs was so complicated, so expensive. Wow. So expensive, you know, so complicated. Yes. So absolutely so small. The the sensors are very small. Uh, yeah, it was uh, extremely difficult, and all the techniques had not been worked out yet. Okay. Yes. So, yes. Um, only the most advanced astronomers were. What is Tony them. using? Is Tony using CCD or the uh, CMOS technology? Because oh, that picture. Tony Alice? I don't. Yeah, know. that picture that David showed was beyond I mean, phenomenal. I mean, I, I suspect he's using a large CMOS chip. Is what that I was. Yeah. I've never seen that look like that before. Yeah, yeah. That well, I remember cluster. Uh, wow. When CMOS came yeah. onto the scene for amateur astronomers, uh, many astronomers said, "No, that's not the way you want to go. You need a CCD sensor." But uh, huge advances started happening in CMOS, and this was driven really by the regular photography community, not the amateur astronomers. There's not a ton it's of not, amateur astronomers out there, but there are millions and millions and millions of regular photographers, you know, and they were driving the market. Uh, night sky photography, like uh, what Adrian Bradley does and Carrie Lotelier do, um, uh, became very popular because they discovered that at night they could see, they, they could image something that was really otherworldly. And, um, so uh and and this was another by, uh, landscapes and you know historic you know ancient buildings against the backdrop of milky way and and star trails and stuff like that it was just beautiful gorgeous you know and it just made a lot of people want to go out and do it you know so yes. and those people those people were largely younger people they were traveling out to these remote sites to do this and now those people are going, gosh, I can see there is a little nebula in my shot. I want a telescope now to go and get detail of that nebula, you know, or that galaxy. So 
yes. Is, uh, yes, it's like you tell Scott, this was another game changing in, yes. the, in the early 2000s where, That's right. where the reflex camera are becoming digital and the people start to use the, the, the old, uh, you know, the people that, uh, that me, that uh, we, uh, we are all, all school about photography and we, we started to, to enjoy the capacity to use long exposures. And of course, the first uh, for me was, oh, come on, I, can, I, I need to, to use this in, in, a, in, a, in a dark skies. Yes. Um, I remember my, my first EOS uh, Rebel, and I was totally amazed uh, to, to, to use it in, in the night uh, sky um this one is this was this one is something that that as you told people started to know uh, about uh, how they can make a, a better a nebula pictures and they, they they came to the amateur astronomy to use this kind of gears mm -hmm. and it was a was a revolution. It's something that sometimes I can't believe that in my 30 years of selling, repairing, you know, uh, manufacturing something, uh, mechanical parts, domes, and it's yeah. so crazy, so crazy the change that from only from 1992 to uh, today is a total insane craziness of technology that we have in our in our community in our uh, hobby specialities, you know, and um, of course that I to, tonight I only show something in the in the clouds, but um, the the possibilities of, of this kind of of uh, uh, telescope very small. Uh, I show you many times pictures that. From here, with colors of the nebula, yes. uh, you know, yes, it's, it's something uh, incredible. Something very incredible. powerful. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure, uh, and this was my presentation. Uh, Thank you. Not presentation, live images. Of course, Thank it's you, Thank you. It's a Thank pleasure. You. Enjoy with that. Okay. Okay. With you. With we're just running. We're running. Good night. A little, <laughs> a little bit ahead. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Um, Cesar's uh, presentation down in Argentina. We are going to go to Brazil uh, at this point with uh, uh, Dr. Marcello Souza. Marcello, thanks for coming on to the 128th Global Star Party. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for the invitation, Scott. Nice to meet all of you. Hello, Marcelo. Hi. I will talk. Is that I I now a uh, free talk about it for me a um, uh, very special moment. Yeah. I'll try to share my screen here. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, I will begin first to talk about here is the Copernicus model. Now uh, that was a change of view of the the Milky Way. Uh, I'm trying to, ah, no, yes, I can share. Yes, Copernicus. And then uh, the changes that we happened when Galileo uh, used the telescope to look to the sky. He wasn't the first person to build a telescope. One year before, Lippe Hay in Netherlands, yes. he asked for to have a patent of a telescope a refractor a telescope. And he didn't get the, pat the pat a patent that was in England, I think. And the, but he, he was the first register of someone that tried to, that he used a telescope, uh, a very simple telescope with lens. And the Galileo received information about this telescope and built two different telescopes and used to look to the sky. Here is the problem that he had when he was uh, uh, 
he wrote a book that was the defense of the model of the Copernicus, a heliocentric project. He, was, he is a draw of he made by Galileo of his first telescope. Well, and I have an insect here, <laughs> like a forest. I don't know if you can listen to the noise here. I have an insect inside my house here today. I don't know how to say the name of this insect in English, but he's making a, a lot of noise. Here. And he is, the telescope is built by Galileo, first telescope. Here is the draw, the Sidereus Nunces book, and I have the draw of the moon, That's how that he saw the moon. Here is the, he was explaining the moons of Jupiter right, in his book. He saw the moons of the Jupiter. This was a way to support the idea of having a star, right, the sun, in the center of the, the solar system, uh, like uh, you see moons around the Jupiter. And uh, this was something that was fantastic. I remember uh, last week, last two weeks ago, when I was looking for Venus, and I remember that uh, Galileo was the first person that uh, wrote, uh, draw, make draws about the phases of the Venus. Mm -hmm. right? That was fantastic. And I saw, like him, a uh, very thin uh, uh, Venus. And uh, what I, I, I would like to talk today is not about the planet, but uh, about his view of the Milky Way. Uh, he saw that uh, where you see the Milky Way in the sky is a, is a place where you have a lot of stars. And this is a big change for our idea, our idea of the universe. When he died, the year that he died is the year that born Isaac, Isaac Newton, by the same year. And this is the, the, the change. This uh, pro uh, proposed, was proposed by Thomas Wright. Uh, he was the first person that uh, imagined uh, the Milky Way as we imagine that is today, as we imagine today. Thomas Wright, from his book, An Original Theory of the Universe, that was published in 1750, he uh, made the first explanation of the appearance of the Milky Way as being to show a mesh in layers of stars. Then if you look in one direction, you see few stars. And if you look in another direction, you see many stars. Now, then we live in a thin, in a thin place in the universe. Now, this is our... But he imagined that he was the cover of uh, a sphere. But this idea, his idea, motivated uh, one famous philosopher, that is Immanuel Kant, mm -hmm. uh, based the, in his hypothesis. Uh, uh, he used his idea as a motivation to imagine that uh, like we can live not only in this, we don't, uh, we don't have only one region in the universe like this. Right? You can imagine that we live in something like this, a small coin. And if you, you are inside this coin, if you, you look up and down, you see few stars. And if you look right and left, you see many stars. And he imagined that it was possible that there existed many different regions like these in the universe that wow. they call islands, uh, universe, islands, universe, something like Island this. Universe. Uh, let me let me find the correct the word that he used. Island universe. Yes. That was the correct word that he used. Island universe. An that island is, in space. Island Universe, that was used oh, by Immanuel Kant. Yeah? 
In Portuguese, it's the universe of ideas. That is the same in English, island universe. Né? That you have many different regions like this. In the, that is idea, the idea that you have today of the galaxies. Né? The idea of the galaxy. That I proposed the first time by Immanuel Kant, based in the original idea from Thomas Wright. But you need the observations. Né? Then you need to wait until Hubble in the 20th century, he proved that the Andromeda, Andromeda galaxy was a different galaxy, was not inside the same region that we live in the universe. But I will not talk about you. This is Kant, if he is a dear. But the big telescope that they, they begin to build big telescopes to uh, make better observations, and this telescope was proposed to me by Herschel, William Herschel, that he built a 40 foot telescope. That this is the project of this 40 telescope that was under was built under the patronage of King George III. And he, he used to, to make observations and he, he made the best prediction of the shape of the Milky Way mm -hmm. from this observation that he made from this telescope. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have another one that's very famous, yeah. that I, I hope I, I say the name correct in English, that is Leviathan. Leviathan, yes. Leviathan in English, no? thank you. In Portuguese, it's Leviathan. Yeah. <laughs> in English, Levi Leviathan. Yeah? That is this one big telescope that uh, they have a platform, but it, it is fantastic because you need to wait the, the stars to pass né? Up in the direction of the telescope because you, you, you can only move the telescope in one position, in one direction. Né? But it was a fantastic telescope that also helped with the observation wow. and uh, you have fantastic results using this telescope that uh, 48 inch diameter telescope. That's a fantastic one. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was possible to discover the spiral arms in galaxies using these telescopes. Then this is fantastic that they support the idea, the model that of Herschel. This was the draw made, made by Herschel of our Milky Way. Mm. The Milky Way. That was fantastic, something fantastic. He imagined the, using the data that he obtained, observing using the big telescope that he proposed. Then it's a very special uh, moment because today uh, we are following, uh, you have many informations about new telescopes that they are built in like the ELT in Chile. That will, will be a fantastic telescope here in the surface of the Earth. I think that uh, you have you need to wait a lot of time to see a telescope bigger than the LT that they are building in the city. I, I, I saw, uh, I visited the VLT, that, uh, that are fantastic. You have three big telescopes with a uh, big mirror and this one is it will be the three times the, the size of the more than three times the size of the mirror of the VLT that will be fantastic I have a, you will have opportunity to see something that you wasn't imagined but I, I will finish now talking about my soccer team here in Brazil uh, that can imagine that they have nothing about uh, associated with astronomy, but it, has, it is associated with astronomy. My team here in Brazil, the name is Botafogo. Is this team here, soccer team? Now, it is the leader of the Brazilian. Uh, this is Brazil, this Brazil. <laughs> happening this weekend. Okay. 
But who, who I am talking about the my soccer team because the symbol of the soccer my soccer team Botafogo is a lone star. Is a lone it's star. Beautiful. Yes. It's a lone star. We say that it. is the uh, most beautiful symbol for a soccer team in the world. <laughs> I don't know, but for me it's no. And uh, here is the symbol. But what is the origin of this symbol? Because in the past, the, the, this uh, club uh, was founded in the beginning of the 20th century. It was a football team, but also you have in the same place here in Rio de Janeiro, a group that uh, uh, wake, wake up very early to go to the, the beach in boats. Uh, I don't remember the name in English, how to say this. I recall in Portuguese, canoa, that they do in the Olympic Games. Né? Then they need to wake up very early to make the exercise and to go to the beach with these boats. And uh, they during, during a long period, they saw the morning star. Né? Then they use this symbol, represents the morning star, that is the planet Venus. Then... This is the history that uh, the symbol will have only one star, the one star, because it represented the planet Venus. And uh, it's a soccer team. Né? My soccer team, I think, I hope that all the astronomers in Brazil like this team, but uh, is, is my, I'm a fan of this team. Né? Thank you very much, Scott. This is what Marcello, I said. thank you today. so much. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck to your team. And thank you for sharing your uh, insight into uh, the discovery of the Milky Way and uh, the precursors to understanding about galaxies. So it's awesome. Yes, for me, it was a very special moment because it, it, he proposed this idea, né? hmm. a theoretical proposal, based on what he saw in the sky. Yes. And then you have it many years later, that uh, how, how do you how do how do you suppose i mean without formal training or no stepping stones really but just to have like this insight that uh, ends up being his idea very was very yes yeah, fantastic because many people saw the same thing that he saw that is part of the sky with the milky way yeah uh, and he he try he begin to imagine what uh, was happening because he knew that have more stars in, in where you, you see the Milky Way, yes. né? From Galileo, Galileo saw this, né? Then with this information, this idea, he imagined uh, maybe we are inside a place with a lot of stars. So maybe he used logic and his yes. imagination together. Fantastic, né? But it's yeah. fantastic because many people saw the same thing that he saw, né? The same thing everybody saw. And he has this idea né, that that's fantastic. And Kant proposed what you have in the idea of the island universe, né, the, right. like a island universe. Né? That is the idea of the galaxy that you have today. He imagined uh, maybe it's not the only place in the universe like this. Maybe you have different ones. Né? Any have islands a lot of in the universe. Yes, Very this cool. is a fantastic. <laughs> Someone make this theoretical né, propose, and uh, many years later, you see that he was right. Né, yes. This proposal. So, That's something so what, what ideas, Marcello? You're a cosmologist. What, what ideas do you think are could be right, uh, and and for us to have a better understanding in the future? Is it string theory? Is it um, yeah, I, I, I worked with the cosmic strings that are uh, topological defects in the beginning of the universe. That you have a problem to understand what happened because if you, you imagine that you live in an isotropic universe, we don't know why in some place you have structures, in other places you don't have structures. What happened in the universe that changed the, in this place to begin to uh, build new structures there. Yeah. 
You don't know why, what's happening, because if you have an isotropic universe, all directions and the all positions are the same. Mm -hmm. no, then no. this is something that uh, we need to find a solution for this. And uh, what I worked and many people believe is that in some reason this was caused by the expansion of the universe. And uh, you have the, the temperature the universe right now, and that you have something that you have phase transitions, like it happened when you have water, okay. and then you have ice. Né? Yes. That, então, maybe this uh, could happen in the past in the universe. Mm -hmm. But uh, nobody, you, don't, you can't uh, accept this today as uh, the correct explanation because we need more elements for this. But we, we made a, the, a discovery in the, of the boson of Higgs, né? Higgs bosons, that was the responsible for when you have the universe with the radiation and then you begin to have, to have particles in the universe. This transition was made by this particle that was, that uh, it is not a particle, but it is a boson possible. that was responsible for the, this transition. That when I studied, it was a toy model. It was a toy model né, that we used né, this. And then it was discovered. Then something that shows that our model is not perfect, but it can explain many things that we see today. Mm -hmm. But uh, we need to make many corrections. Uh, and one of the problems is uh, why you have structures in one region and in, in not in other regions. Then I think that this is something that uh, we need to find a solution for this. So, yeah. so do you think do you think that humanity is getting closer to understanding, or do you think that we're going away? I I, I don't think direction? so because uh, uh, if you, you know the the model that you have the Big Bang model today, ninety ninety five percent of the model we don't know what it is because twenty percent. Yeah is right. a, a dark matter and 70 percent is dark energy that when we use this word because we don't know what is then we need many things uh, to um, i think that we need another uh, propose right? because i think that when we have this kind of problems is that we are going in the wrong direction. Né? And we need a different it's paradigm. In Portuguese, it's paradigm. I don't know the correct word in English, but it's paradigm. We need a different one. I don't know that if it's the correct word in English that we use in Portuguese for this. It's something that we use many times, but we need to find another vision, né? another position. Uh, see from a different region né, mm -hmm. to to find a different way, like Einstein did when he he, he proposed the general relativity. That uh, right. for, in the idea of Einstein that used today, gravitation is not a force. It is it is uh, what happened with the topology of the universe. Right? I see. It's not a force. Uh, for, for Newton, it was a force. Uh, okay. Something physics is, fant is fantastic. No? Yeah. Okay. Uh, really funny. James book. Webb is starting to teach us more, but we don't know what to think of it because it's already so far advanced from what other instruments showed us that we're awestruck and we're relearning everything that we potentially knew before. That's right. From yeah. that telescope is going to really change. The, the way we see our universe yes. once they can figure out you know the the data yes yep. yeah. okay all right Susan, uh marcello thank you so much thank you very much it's a great pleasure yeah. to be here okay okay all right uh so uh we've got good evening <laughs> i'm not in the dracula cluster i'm in a blue origin uh, sort. No, no, <laughs> you are in the dark side tonight, John. I um have went You're incognito. 
I'm in <laughs> You, you but, know uh, he's an alien because he's got his glasses on upside well, down. These yeah, are my <laughs> I'm psycho. <laughs> these are tools for my astronomy, and I wanted to show everybody more tools for okay. exploration. Okay. So let me take these off. I apologize, but I'm, I'm dark adapting. This is my night hood, my dark hood, that when I look through the eyepiece, I like. Oh, yeah, hood. it's a good idea. Yeah. And it's duvet, yes. which is a material that, that, uh, you know, basically blocks all stray light out. And as you know, being yeah. an astronomer, when uh, you get cars going, I'm going to take this off. I'm burning alive. I've been, whew, it's a beautiful <laughs> night. Anyways. I was viewing a couple objects in my blue heavens yeah. tonight. So it's, it's quite a beautiful yeah. night here. Yeah. Got my NASA. NASA shirt. Yeah. Love NASA. Yeah. Right. Always but uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on with tools of the universe. Uh, I specialize in, you know, bringing tools of the universe to view the heavens. Yes. And for visual, you, you really need tools at most. Well, it's a, not only a, an addiction, but you need all these tools to do every aspect of our of our hobby, you know, like uh, the camera and that setup that Caesar had is absolutely amazing what you can do with that because just on your balcony alone you can have views after it starts to stack and build the image equivalent to what i would see from a dark sky site through my 28 inch which is unbelievable so uh the views you know are very important but also astrophotography all these are tools that we have for exploration and it's teaching us a lot more about it and um Man, Tony's image tonight was beyond amazing. Oh, yeah. I could not believe how wonderful that process is. I've never seen one like that. It's unbelievable. But uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my photo started here. Okay. Uh, this is GSP 128 now, right? 128. Wow. I remember when it was 50. <laughs> yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah, it's really uh, been a fun adventure. Yes, it, it you is. know, I, I can't wait to get up and running finally so I can show you some live views. I, I'm going to do this sooner or later. But anyway, let's uh, begin with some of my work. So this was Star Party Weekend. That's why I couldn't make last uh, Tuesday. This is Bosco, my dog, waiting for me to take him to go to the mountain. Mount Pinos is where yes, we go. Yes. It's a 9,000 feet up, very nice, clear, transparent sky. Yes. He, uh, this was just after the hurricane hit. He was out in the back. He got locked out, so I had to get him in and dry him off. He was not happy. Uh, here we are at the star party. This is up at Mount Pinos. We're set up a group of us ready to go. That's uh, my 28-inch and my ladder course in my trailer you need a big ladder to go up these things that's another you know with the big telescopes like the leviathan you really need a big ladders to get up in there and you know what another neat thing is, is when you think of the leviathan they had to wait for the view to rotate into view because the earth is rotating yes. and they also have mercury mirror telescopes where they spin mercury and and it performs uh it makes a parabola like a spherical parabola and then they can use that as a telescope so it's actually a liquid mirror and the same thing they have to wait for that to drift into view because they can't tilt it because the mercury would fall out so i, I thought that was kind of cool here's a setup this is the 24 inch kennedy that's a, and behind it's my 28 and uh, that's by Mike Garrett's trailer. Here's another angle at the star party. These are big instruments, uh, you know, to look through for amateur work. 28 inch is pretty good size. And we had some amazing views at that altitude. Just absolutely stunning views um, with the transparency and had the hood on. I was really cutting out the stray light and it made a big difference on your dark adaption. This is um, actually a picture taken through that 28-inch telescope. 
from here on earth of the pillars of creation. I was very proud of this picture. Mirko helped me do it. Uh, he's the astrophotographer and we used my telescope. But that picture was cropped out of a, a larger wide field shot. And this is what I was able to get from here on earth with a CMOS camera. Pretty proud of it. Yes, beautiful. It's almost Hubble-like, but not quite. <laughs> this is another section from below that. So if you look at the bottom of the section, you see those little, it looks like hands are reaching out to the, to the glowing gas cloud to, you know, it's just a, an amazing painting that nature has created through the molecular gas clouds and when they condense. Well, these are paintings, right? I mean, they're, these are well, no this paintings. is actually a painting from the actual photograph. Yes. From the photograph. Okay. Yeah, this is through the 28 again. And yeah. from here on earth, this is what I was able to get with that scope with wow. the camera. I mean, the hands, see the bottom part with the hands? It's, isn't that just uncanny? Yeah. The gas clouds, how they're reaching, like they're reaching for light, like life. It's uh, just amazing. Yeah. The nature, the, the universe, what it. It John, does. So, we, yeah. we have a question from uh, Robert on who's watching on YouTube. He sure. says, he says, these are amazing. He says, what was your favorite object to see visually that night? Well, I'm going to show you. Okay. It's funny you should say that because it's coming up. Uh, let me go to it. It was this one. M51. This is another version that I, I've been working on as well. And, um, so I was looking through the 32 inch on this night and you could see some amazing spiral structure. So I would have to say this was my favorite object for that evening. Uh, to be able to resolve spiral arms with uh, direct vision and to see the core as a stellar point of light. And then even hints of the dark dust lane, which is actually the spiral arm being gravitationally uh, affected by the other galaxy, the satellite, and it's distorting it. So it's pulling on it, this tremendous force. You know, when two galaxies collide, they virtually go through each other until, you know, the gravity affects it. Once the, the gravity starts to take hold, then everything gets ripped apart and, you know, misconstrued into probably a large elliptical Anyway, so there you go. That was my favorite one. This was another very good one to look at that evening. Uh, this is NGC 246, the Skull Nebula. And um, it's also considered maybe even uh, an emission nebula, partially. It has a uh, three-star system in it. And when you look in the eyepiece, you can actually see this is exactly what I was seeing with um, an NPB filter and a VHC filter. Uh, different times, of course, you have to rotate the filter selection. But, you know, this is a great planetary nebula to see in a, a very large aperture telescope. And this is a drawing, Scott. Very happy with Here's the way this. Yes. Wow. It, it almost looks like it's floating there, right? It, yes. <laughs> That's a, it's a white dwarf in there too. Um, yeah. Very powerful system. You know, um, for those of you who might be seeing some of John's uh, drawings for the very first time, uh, John is an, a great artist in his own right. Uh, he, um, I was visiting his Facebook page and uh, I really, you know, I don't know which gallery you were in, but uh, the Salvador Dali portrait that you did. Oh, uh, thank was you. Really amazing, you know. So, uh, you are you're an extremely talented uh, and gifted artist. So, you know, Salvador was connected to the universe. I mean, a lot of his stuff was uh, clouds and, and space. You know, in his mind, he was very aware of a lot of this stuff, and. Um, his knowledge of, you know, it's very good, but he was a very unique artist. 
uh, seeing hidden imagery, you know, within nature was probably one of the neatest things he ever did was creating, you know, hidden content. So very, very amazing artist to be a part of. My father, you know, knew him as a person. I never got to meet him, but I did get to see like a lot of his really nice works that were special. Wow. This one, uh, this is what we're going to get with a best night at Mount Pinos through a 28 inch. And this is called the Cat's Eye Nebula in Draco, the constellation. Now this was uh, roughly 1600 light years, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's basically what would happen to our sun when it blows up. It goes into what's called a planetary nebula. So the internal star will probably become a white dwarf. And then that inner ring is actually the, the blast of the internals of that star. And that would basically probably be reaching out to the outer planets, the, you know, the inner ring. So as far as Earth goes, we would be in the inner inner ring, probably vaporize uh, if that happened, but it won't happen for a long time. Mm -hmm. But you know, inevitably a race is faced with having to leave their planet because their star is going to explode. So alternatively, there is no alternative. You have to look out to space to find a new planet to colonize or a new place to live. So for any race, especially ours, it's critical that we make progress on all of this knowledge that's going to get us to be able to survive, you know, and, uh, and pass the seeds of life throughout the cosmos. It's what I believe a, a race would do if it could survive till then, you wow. know, super intelligent. We're getting there, slow but sure. Yeah, very slowly, it seems. I mean, how long ago <laughs> was it that they had the Wright brothers? And now look at what we're doing. Well, that's true. I mean, we did make you know, it. That's right. And astronomically, my goodness, can you imagine how far we've come? Like Caesar on his patio doing images that out, you know, nobody saw that kind of detail. No, that's true. But it's that's just true. such a gift we have with this technology and you know, the little refractors, the more I see them, I, that's and how I would affordable. start. It's crazy. I mean, it's multi, multi-million dollar technology, you know, yeah. build down. So, but that's what we does. What we do as humans, you know, we can take, right. we do something that uh, is, was, was extremely costly and we bring it down, you know? So, you know, I mean, I that's often talk hoping. to my friends about the invention of the wheel, you know, and, and what mm -hmm. that might have cost. <laughs> you know? oh, well, the square ones, you know, once they chipped off, they probably figured it out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the corners fell off and hey, wait a minute. <laughs> that's right. There's a, so, uh, there's a question here, John, and a comment. Okay. Uh, Andrew Corkill is watching. Um, on uh, it looks like uh, YouTube here, and he said he wanted to know how long do you spend at the eyepiece to create these drawings? You know, I have to be honest, uh, as much time as I can each night, but we have a, a list of objects that we go through. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes if I'm drawing it, I'll go back to it when everybody yeah. goes back to bed. And, and I'll look at this object for at least an hour and, and I've been looking at this object. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've drawn this a hundred times. So yes. I've got years of looking at this under my belt, to be honest with you. I see. So but, you know, this is, this is really exactly what you see with the big telescope up at Mount Pinos. I mean, right. that's just, you don't really get much more resolution visually than that. I mean, that's actually really good views. It looks, it looks so natural and real. Thank you. So, Wilson, yeah. you know, we went to Wilson. Wilson shows better. Yeah, but of course. It does, yeah. I mean, this is kind of dimensional. It has that little glow to it. I, I was very happy with this. I just barely got it finished. You know, a lot of these I do a, a field sketch and then, then I go ahead and, and then take it home and really, you know, work on it. And so 
let me see. Um, this is my field sketch. So here's something I wanted to share with all of you. You want to talk about a time machine. So we were doing spiral galaxies that were double interaction galaxies. So there was two or three different ones. This was the best one other than M51. So if you look at that, it, it resembles M51, right? Very much. Sure. And this is an actual field sketch. So this is what I do right on my you cell phone. Right, right from the eyepiece, what you right saw. Right from the, yeah, exactly what I'm seeing. All right. And um, yeah. now this object, get ready for this. M51 right here is roughly 23 million light years away and a magnitude eight point something. So you're gonna see this pretty good from a dark sky site. You can see this in binoculars, yeah. a six inch and a six sure. inch telescope is a great refle reflector to start with. I have, uh, I have fibers. this object in a 70 millimeter toy yeah. refractor before. So you can see how bright and, and how much definition you get. Now you go back over here, check this out. Here's where you're gonna, this is gonna wrap your mind. This object is 270 million light years away in Pegasus, the constellation. There's uh, 7753 and 7752 is the edge on. Right. So they're they're interacting, and mm. so that means when I was looking at this in my eyepiece, that mm. light traveled at the speed of light for two hundred and seventy million years. Can you imagine how far that is? Uh, the no. distance? No, you can't. I mean, it's you it's, can't it's even light years five point nine trillion miles um, times. Not 277 million? million. I mean, how many <laughs> zeros is that? It's, it's crazy. I, I'm lost. My head just <clears throat> right. got lost. So now um, this is yeah, after. This is, not, this is not the enormity of the universe. This is just. No, this is a close neighbor, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> so. I mean, when you're looking back at, at the uh, James Webb telescope images, some of those yeah. uh, red shifted, those were before the recorded, you know, Big Bang, supposedly. So it just proved how are their galaxies already there before the, you know, they don't know. It's just, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's crazy. Okay, and then, so uh, we got we got some more comments here. Uh, okay. Uh, Space Time with Robert's watching watching on YouTube. He says, he says oh, wow, these are drawings? I was yeah. mistaken, these were CCD images. These are stunning. No. <laughs> See, the thing is, is, um, if you want to see the best views visually, there's yeah. several factors. And like Scott said, you can promise people views, but then when you get up, it clouds up or the scene goes to crap. You know, you just don't yeah. want to curse it. You just want to kind of lie low and let it unravel. And we were rewarded with some amazing scene because of the altitude. So Bortle 1, if you can get to a dark sky site, even with a six inch telescope, you can see a lot of these objects. They're gonna be a lot smaller, but you can see them. Now, if you combine Bortle one with 6,000 feet of altitude, now you're getting some transparency and darkness. So you're really taking a big advantage of visual astronomy because that's gonna get you your best look is being above all the haze and no, that's you know, have, that's true. you know, and, and it's not always guaranteed. Now, here's the evolution of this galaxy after I just imagined being there. I traveled 270 million light years in my mind and bam, through my eyepiece, this is what it looks like. So that's a simulated eyepiece. You're looking into the eyepiece. I see. And you're seeing the there was hints of some spiral. I this, this I added to kind of like yeah. what Michael Carroll does, where he shows us things imagined by a space artist. Okay. Yeah. Um, but this looks so natural. These, so these were averted vision hints. I was able to pick up in the thirty-two inch. Yeah. Uh, the thirty-two inch had a little more grasp, you know, than the twenty-eight, and that's where it hurts me the most is when I get against the 32, when you look at galaxies 
and globular clusters, yeah. you're in for a surprise. Um, the first thing you notice is like the Deerlick Galaxy NGC 7331 was completely uh, an edge on spiral with a brilliant core. Mm. I mean, I could see the arms wrapping around and it was tilted, yeah. you know, very similar to Andromeda. Cool. And in, in Tony Hallis's picture, there's actually jets coming out of that thing. Hmm. I mean, that's an amazing galaxy to look at. Pegasus is a great constellation, yeah. um, has many great galaxies. They have another double, 7331, 7332, which is visible in binoculars. It's that bright. Um, again, from a dark sky site, a six-inch telescope will get you there. An eight-inch Schmidt Cassegrain, you know, even refractors, um, which I always say, when I started, I started with a refractor because it was simple. I didn't have to collimate it no. and I could, I could move it around real easy and I got real comfortable using it. So I could find stuff. You just shoot the tube, you know? And then when you get into the reflector, well, the first real reflector was from Telescope City. It was a Parks six inch F8 with extremely good optics. And I witnessed the Fragment G hit Jupiter and rotated around. I, I looked at that from my outside of my apartment. I couldn't believe it. Hey, so, uh, John, uh, we have an opportunity right now. Cesar has got, for the moment, some clear skies, and he's got four. Oh yes, let's let's do it. Let's do it. Right. Let's go. So let's let's go ahead and switch, and then we'll come back to you because yes, there's yes. more comments, and uh, all right, we want to know more about your technique here. Yes, of course. That that you can continue, John. I I sh I can show you why. Well, you Caesar, see the show us. I want to see. <laughs> oh yeah, this is great. Oh, oh wow. man, there we go. Yeah. Live. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful globular. It's a it's a globular. It's that, thirteen. Uh, no, uh, ninety two. Uh, I. Uh, let me let me check because for me, why it has a propeller almost like it, it looks like thirteen. Yes, I don't know, but uh, yes, Beautiful. I think that is it, it's very bright, very bright. Yeah. If we we wow. can compare fifteen thousand uh, light years away and one hundred twenty light years in diameter. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> which got which globular is that? It's a uh, forty-seven two Kenne. Um, oh my, that is the best globular ever. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. At this moment we have this one in the in the in the in the field. And it's very interesting because it's sorry that the noise it's a it's a not a not uh you know uh processed image, it's not it's a live image. But it's very interesting. Really, it's a, a. I read that I wrote that this cluster, the globular cluster, it's a very <clears> curious, <throat> curious for for astronomers because don't have a doubly binary system that is normal to found in this kind of clusters. Um, this one have a particular structure that is outside the box in this kind of cluster. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, it is very bright. And yeah. it's in this in it this small second brightest, second brightest globular cluster in the sky. Yes, to... yes, it's called sure. Omega and, mm -hmm. and have the particularity that is not in the in the Magellan small Magellan cloud. If not in it's in the light of in the line of vision but not is inside oh, of okay. yes, it's outside the the magnet cloud, small magnet cloud. It's it between. It's in the same line of vision, but it's it's not it's not a part of a magnet cloud. Maybe maybe in the field of vision, maybe maybe we can move. It's it's like an over. I think that we can. See tonight the Magellan cloud. You think so? Let's try. Let's try. Then, 
That's a satellite a galaxy, right? The right? star cluster was discovered in 1750 or 51 by Nicholas Louis de Lacan uh, from South Africa. Uh, he, um, uh, it says that they, they telescopically, that uh, 47 Tucanae uh, reveals about 10,000 stars and may contain an intermediate mass black hole. I was down there and I saw that through a 12 inch telescope that I brought. Oh man. And it looked like literally like M5 or M15, very similar in my 28. <laughs> I mm. couldn't imagine seeing that in a 28 inch telescope. It knocked right. you right off the ladder. Yeah. Yes. It's very, very, really very dense. Interesting. Sure. Here's a comment from John Ray watching on Facebook. He says, Scott, thank you for another thoroughly enjoyable Global Star Party. This yeah. plus other space science astronomy channels have been the high points of an otherwise washed out New England summer. Not much wow. use of my CPC 1100 in a sky ship. Wow. wow. Hoping for that's... better autumn. Thanks again. Yeah, that's wow. beautiful, beautiful telescope, CPC 11. Yeah. yeah. Von, you know, that's the Andrew, beauty. Andrew Corkill was uh, commenting on your uh, drawings there, John. He says, he says, hey, I stepped away for a minute. Wait a minute. John is <laughs> sketching these on his cell phone? Is that right? <laughs> well, that's pre-production. Then they go to post-production, which is to my iPad with Procreate. But I'm very comfortable on the cell phone. Yeah. Um I'll show you my M13 I'm working on. My thumb was seized up on it, but um, okay. I'll show you when okay. we get back. <laughs> Caesar, can you do Omega or it's still not uh, up? Uh, I'm uh, continuing you, and I, I, if I have another another interesting thing in the field, I advise. Yeah, come back. All right. How yes, about the yes, cold yes. I'm the cold still, sack. I'm still, yes, we are in Star Party. I'm still, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> still. Uh, yes, I'm still. Let's go uh, view it, man. I'm ready to go. Maybe something in the area of, of Scorpius. Okay. Oh, yes. There yes. we go. Okay, Beautiful. so back to you, John. I'm back. I'm, be, I'm back. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Okay. Um, All right. So we had a question. You were talking about your process. Uh, uh, you know, where you do like your initial drawing on a phone. Here it is. Okay. This is my my latest M13. Very nice. So it, it's early stages. I'm not done. I just this is the rough. I it's I've been working on it for a while. But um, you know they start out very crude, and then. Um, how how accurate? I mean, if I took a photograph and then I laid your, like, took your drawing as a transparency or something. It, it's similar. Stars? Well, what I do is um, I'll go back after I go in the field with some of my globular clusters and I'll go into procreate with the side by side mode. Okay. And when I when I check in, I realize how far off I am on I some of these do. star plots. Yeah. Right. So I corrected, but you know, depending how transparent you are on the post, when you post it, you explain sure. stuff, you know, that, that yes, I was using yeah, yeah, photographic yeah. I mean, cues. There's some people make yeah. extreme claims, you know. Yeah, you know. no, this, I could never right. do this at the eyepiece this accurate. There's just okay. no way. Right. I, I use my skills. Um, the feeling of it is definitely there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, what I'm trying to capture is what I'm seeing right at the eyepiece. And I'm telling you the truth, this is exactly what I see with a 10 ethos or even your uh, nine millimeter, 198 degree eyepiece. They're very similar. Yeah. Uh, I like the little extra power. It gets you in a little closer, but we were comparing those two eyepieces and there is not much difference, you know, other than the power. I mean, that nine is stunning. Um, that Jerry has. That's your nine that we always use. Um, thanks. Thank you. Unbelievable Thank you. eyepiece and, and literally resolves these down to the core. This is what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. It just really amazes me that we can see yeah. this kind of detail. Andrew says he's still using white pencils and black paper. So he wants to learn your cell phone tech. Yeah. Um, 
now if you want to check out more if you go to cloudy night sketching forums yeah there's a forum dedicated and you can ask questions and uh there's a lot of people my friend andrew clark is very good he, he does the same way i've actually done pictures like that sketches with a white powder and um yeah. you know brushes and then using charcoal and some uh different color you know gray dark black and then white charcoal pencils from general general makes them you use a blending stub and um there's a technique that that they use that's based on that theory so yeah, yeah i recommend checking into cloudy nights and um sketching forums and you can get a gist of what can be done there's some amazing guys on there doing the same same kind of work as you are and it's it's a fun place to go and, and the beauty again is with you know astrophotography and and this platform the yeah. global star party we're able to enjoy our our hobby all the time like That's the true. the fellow in england said with, you know we got friends stumped. around the world right and you know what that's why i love tuning in i mean when i can't do viewing this is where i go or i'll yeah. go to cloudy nights and and i'll get my viewing in through other people's hard work you know and it's the beauty of this um platform yes yeah I had to, I had to jump in. I mean, I was always more into, you know, star hopping and not using computers. And sure, but now, sure. now it's just, you just use the technology. And it's, well, yeah. Yeah. Advantage of all the tools, right? So. Oh, you see so much more. It, and this enhances, look at Caesar controlling his telescope. So I can I tell you a story. My buddy's hand controller broke. He okay. was, he was done. He goes, wait a minute, I can just use my phone. And then he went to Sky Safari, much like your program for the okay. Exos. Yeah. And bam, he restored it with his cell phone. <laughs> and and saved the night. Now he's like back in action. You know, yeah, he was a little, better it's, it's, it's actually yeah. a better <laughs> controller than what he had before. I know. And that's what I gotta do with mine. I gotta get my cell phone connected because yeah, that's I right. Mean, it, it's just I can even show you some cell phone pictures. Uh, you know what what you can do with some of this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing uh, what what can be done. Uh, well, I just uh, I'm going to scroll. Do I have a second, or are we going to go back to Caesar? Go ahead, go ahead. I'm just uh, uh, we got some people that are okay. You know, people wa watching in many different time zones and stuff. So uh, right, we got to keep on schedule. I did. Oh, no, no, no. I'm I'm oh. just saying. You know, good night to some of these people because they're oh, okay. going to sleep. So yeah, that's crazy. They're you know, around the world. hours and hours of difference here uh, between so, us and where they are. So here's a cell phone snapshot. So this just gives you an idea of. So okay. you have the CMOS technology that's in our cell phones. In our phones, yeah, that's crazy. And and this was taken through the eyepiece, and that's the pillars of creation with the cell phone. Yeah, is that just well, there's a creation mind. right there? Yeah, through your and cell phone, handheld probably, right? Yeah, handheld. Uh, it was like a 10 second exposure, I think, through the 32 inch. It's crazy. So yeah, I mean, it, it it really it really gives you just it's amazing what you can do with it. Uh, yeah. So many different, you know. So that that felt. Oh, I got to finish with my presentation. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I got sidetracked. <laughs> you know, I get, I, I'm a Segway kind of a guy anyway. <laughs> but I apologize for that. Oh, I cool. got to stay on task. You guys get me so excited. Caesar, man, he's pulling it out. I yeah, haven't seen fun. 47 in a while. Thank you, Caesar. It's fun. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, really. Uh, yeah. I have, I have another object in the field. Okay. Uh, M4. Let's, M4. Oh yes. M4? Let's look. Okay. Let's go. M4. Okay. M4. All right, we're gonna switch. Switching. Yes. This is the beauty sure. of being able to switch here. I know. This is sorry. Great. <laughs> right, I'm gonna add you. It's only for illustrating right, so your presentation. <laughs> no, no. Let's go full screen. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Caesar. M4. Big difference. Yes. Wow. M4. M4. That it's, is really it's, amazing. It's it's very interesting. I I making only small single pictures of ten right. sec seven seconds seven seconds. It's very wow. interesting. This shape, look that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
you have like a, a lot of stars. Yes, absolutely, John. And maybe sometimes when you took the 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 you know you you took this the this taken picture, uh, right. sometimes you lose in the in the bright of, of mm -hmm. the final picture, you lose these details that are very interesting yeah. because you have here like a, a line of stars. Of course, that is maybe something, uh, you know, uh, from our point of view. Yes, right. it's a, 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 our point of view, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting. You know, the stars I can see uh, explain. So they have a reddish cast. Does that mean that those stars are older? They're old red stars? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's I, I that so. have Wikipedia can illustrate uh -huh. us about about the, this this cluster. I don't know. Well, I have. Sorry, I have. Uh, I have. In when my, you zoom in on it, you can see the stars. Yes, are red. Uh, I have here. Sorry, I have. Oh, the, the, in my application of of explore scientific, I have a lot of information. Sorry, Scott. Okay. <laughs> what does M4, it and it's also the signet it's a global cluster in the constellation of Scorpius was discovered by Philippe Lois de Chisou de Chisou in one, uh, 1746 and catalogued from, by Charles Massier in 1764 it was the first global cluster in which individual stars were resolved wow M4 is a conspicuous, sorry, my, my lecture in English is oh, terrible. It's it, it seven, the, the smallest is, is conspicuous in even the smallest of telescope as a fusible ball of light. It appears about the same size of the moon in the sky, and this is one of the easiest globular clusters to find, being located at only 1.3 degrees west to the bright star Antares with both objects being visible in a wide field telescope. Models of this size telescope will begin to resolve individual stars of which the bright is in M4 are of apparent magnitude of uh, 10.8. M4 is a rather loosely concentrated cluster of class four and measures 75 light years across. Wow, 75 years crazy. of size. This is very wow. interesting. Wow. Huge. It's a feature of characteristic, a characteristic bar structure. Ah, the bar structure that we are watching. This is very it's interesting because it's something that we are watching now. This is the bar structure. I you wonder know. if they're ti titling. I, I, I love when you have the information in, in the, you know, in, in right. the application. I love that. It's because this is, I love that. Okay, and it's so so clear. The people ah. that write this is it's amazing. M4 Beautiful. is approximately seven. The, the distance is seven thousand uh, two hundred like years away. The same wow. distance that NGC six three nine seven. I don't know. I don't remember the what NGC is. Making this to a closest global cluster. Ah, in the hour solar system no to our sorry to our is the are the, one of the closest uh global cluster to our solar solar system uh and this estimates like, like the age the, the age is of the age is to 12.2 billion years wow I, I can say it's very old, but I don't know if comparing with another cluster is so old. Uh, yeah, it's undergone, it undergone a core collapse. One of 20 globulars that had the core collapse. Yes. Meaning that the core is contracted to a very dense stellar agglomeration. Yeah. So, yeah, it's probably might even, I don't know, have a black hole like M or My like. Yeah, the one you just looked at, uh, 47. I try if we have in the field of view, maybe I have N22 in, in second. Yeah, I was going to suggest go to that one because it's such a big one. It, it'll be a mind blower yes. on 
That'll you feel it. you can continue with your presentation and why okay. I what I search in another another global cluster. You are agreed, okay. Scott. <laughs> yes. This is awesome, Caesar. Good job. Yes, but let's not Thank take you, too much time away from John. Yeah, we don't want to go too far. We'll yeah, get yeah. later and later for <laughs> I am <moved. laughs> But it is I just fun. Bring. Because the noise, because the noise of go to watch it. Yeah, but you both you know. have the stage right now, so okay. Yes, yes. You both do things. So. And tell me ideas in the area of uh, uh, Scorpio and Sagittario cluster that you remember, or you know. But I, I, I'm try if M twenty two is is in the. So, I think you're going to get a good show with the twenty two. Now, this is uh, something I'm looking into. I just, this is my friend Tong from Hubble Optics. Okay. Uh, he sent me a picture of the 40 inch. Is this a so, folded Newtonian? Yeah, it's a okay. folded. And yeah. I'm just checking into it. You know, I'm not, how could I afford something like this? <laughs> I wish. But if you look at this thing, I mean, it's 40 inches. So, it's amazing, or or even Norm scope, the one you guys are doing. It's very right. similar. Too. Yeah, Norm has a, he has a fifty inch right now for sale for only one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I only. say only, okay, <laughs> but but a fifty inch telescope, you know. Oh yeah, you couldn't buy the mirror for you know $150, no thousand dollars. No, not even that's this your professional observatory. He's got. Jeez. And, uh, you think my wife would let me take a second out? Sure, of I course you would. In, yeah. I'll move into the scope. Who needs a mobile home? I'll just travel at the speed of light. <laughs> Put wheels on that thing. Yeah. You don't need wheels. It flies on its own. Now, how, how much is this scope? It's for sale. I, right? I don't know yet. I, he just showed me a couple pictures I was oh, asking I see, about. I see. I'm not, you know, I got to <clears throat> look into it. 50 inches, also a folded Newtonian. And yeah, what it does it pulls it, down. It's it's like all right. uh, lightweight and everything. That mirror cools down in see? twenty minutes. See how their mirror is a sandwich on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see how the eyepiece goes up at an angle. And then yeah, and it's so it's a much bigger secondary because it's intercepting sure. the light cone. Yeah, but uh, you're not going to climb this ladder right perilous heights. You know where if you uh, fell off, you might be done for. You know so. It might be worth it though at F5, 40 inch F5. That's only 200 that's an inches. Okay. No, that's an F3.5. But I was just oh. imagine having that small secondary oh. and, and the view you would get with the with the long focal Newtonian. Yeah. You'd I would be need like some sort of uh, cherry picker or something. Yeah, you because you know if you just laid back for a second, you could be dead. You don't want to do that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I I broke four ladders. <laughs> I, no, I'm not climbing up that high. I, I've I, had people freeze on my ladder at Zenith. Yeah. And just, oh, yeah, you got to get them down. Yeah, I had to use fire and, you know, what a torch, a mini torch. I just was joking. I wasn't going to light them up. But um, what, it, what I found out is that their fear of fire was greater than their fear of heights. They came right down. I see. <laughs> yeah. But Works it's a joke. So here's a group of the, the Japanese fellows. I can imagine on that island, they get some good seeing, you know, good oh, yeah. spots. It's pretty. And it, it looks similar to Norm's design, really. I mean, Norm has a great design. His is probably more rigid. I don't know. I have to have to look at it, but it's just a dream, you know. These yeah. are dreams. But again, these are tools for exploration. And when I get these things, you know, I share these with people. This is my mission. Oh. No, that's uh, you know, that's what we do. And with this global star party, we share and, you know, we've been together at big, big star parties and we've yeah. had crowds of people looking through our scopes. And, sure. you know, sure. that's that's what that's what this is about for me is is teaching the public and giving them real views of what can be seen in the universe. And um, right. there's nothing right. better than than hearing people say they saw something like two people told me. Uh, a lady with two sons I go do you want to see the central star in the ring and it, the seeing was so good we saw both stars oh, and here's wow. a lady that does hasn't even seen the ring nebula she's uh -huh. going oh my gosh I see two stars and her sons 
they saw the stars and I was just running around happy because That's cool. man, I hadn't even seen it like that before. And then for just some novice people to come up and look yeah, and get a look are just from nature, lucky great observers, you know, they, yeah. they don't even know, they have no idea that they're already gifted, you know, so. And, and then, you know, the with audience. this, you have to spend a lot of time and then you can see the light that shines, you know, there's a lot of scattered light pollution in some places. And so shielding your eyes really makes a difference uh, if you want to get the best view and, you know, using techniques like averted vision, drawing. If you're doing art and trying to draw what you're seeing at the eyepiece, it's going to make you a better observer by many folds because you're keen on little details. And if you just spend the time looking at that, they reveal themselves, but it takes yeah. time. Your eyes are very sensitive and you have to understand those photons, they've been traveling for a long time. And when they hit your eyes, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's magic. man, it it's is. yeah, it's it beyond. It's, you start drilling down and start really thinking about you yeah. know, what's going on, you know, then it's, it's uh yeah. And, and that's, that's one of the things that anybody's listening to this. I mean, they, they need to kind of, you know, shrug off, you know, thinking about what's normal and what's what what they experience every day. There is no such thing as the everyday experience. No. You are. I mean, just I mean, you know, you, you start learning about uh, just from a very general, a very basic level. Some of the um, things that, you know, that the physicists know. OK. Um, that, uh, you know, the, the rays of, you know, the different rays coming from space, some of them passing through our bodies, the atomic structure of our bodies, the age of the elements in our bodies. I mean, we are, you got stuff that's ancient, ancient stuff, you know? And uh, so it's, it is, uh, it makes me dizzy sometimes to, so how about, about this? Stuff, but it is why I'm into astronomy, you know, and I, so I, I sometimes I force myself to think about uh, Carl Sagan's pale blue dot first thing in the morning. Yeah. I do it, you know, I'll, I'll pull it up on either on YouTube or I'll read it, you know, and, uh, and that puts, that puts things into perspective right there. Whatever problem you had is like zero compared to what's going on in the universe. Okay. So uh, it's a stoic life we live. You get humbled, you know. If you just, you know, look at things, notice the the sun, the stars, the the trees. Yeah, it's uh, it's, plants, it's our mother. everything's it's reaching alive, you know. So. It, it's it's all connected together, everything. That's and hard. um, that's what's so cool. So this would be hard to go to zenith yeah. with. And this I, is they have a, a term for it in in popular. Uh, English language and it's called woke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> woke up. <laughs> woke. That's it. You know, I, I just every day I I thank God when I see the sun in the morning and I look up and, and I just see this glorious blue sky and, and the color shift from from night to day and that's the magic hour when when you just take a time to reflect on how special of a gift that we have and in, in that, you know, looking at the universe is so important for us as it has it been is. for, it for is. all equity of man and, and they build yeah. monuments and there's a reason, yeah. there's a reason why, and that's, that's connection. That's right. We're all part of it. And, yeah. and eventually we're trying to, we're, we're trying to yeah, we're, experience. So the, it's a yeah. gift, man. Every day is like the, like the last day of my life. It's the best day I'm ever going to have. <laughs> I think I thought John Ray was going to sleep. He woke back up. He says, it kept me sane and firmly planted for over six decades. That's right. John. Wow. Yes. That's right. It really uh, does uh, help me. Robert uh, watching uh, Space Time with Robert, we're watching on YouTube. He says, my dream is a 10 inch go-to dog using EAA. That's electronic. Oh, yeah. Astronomy. These scopes are a whole different level. He says, I'd need a bathroom after looking through one of those. <laughs> no, you know what? The 10 inch will show you so much. If you it's put true. the electronically assisted oh, yeah. uh, a reflex camera or, or a, right. like a CMOS camera, 
you don't even need a big telescope. You just oh. have to get through the learning curve of uh, and with the with your program with that you know phone program. It okay, just you makes have like it a almost... cell phone controlling it, and then you've got so a easy. fairly simple camera. I mean, you're the effect of that. It'd be an interesting experiment experiment to actually calculate what the effective visual aperture is, you know, oh, time so seven using one of these electronic cameras on these 70 inch, there. probably like using a hundred inch or something. Mm -hmm. you know? so if you did, see, I think that is the, the power, the real power of optics and aperture is, yes, it's magic yeah. without electronics, without many people. Sometimes when I came from the store to, 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 to ask about telescope, tell me uh, it's something that they need batteries to, um, and they are talking about of, of the Oxonian, uh, you know, yeah. uh, they, because they um, don't expect that only the optics make the the magic. <laughs> not yeah. the magic, not real it's physics. I have the back nebula, if you like. Oh, yes. Let's go. Now, no. Uh, Oh, hey, okay, uh, you, I know, but you, you, you need to switch me, maybe. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. A okay. few seconds uh, here, here. Oh, yeah. Tonight, tonight, I have now I, I have a clear sky. Now, this yeah. is live from Caesar's balcony. Okay, wow, yes. no way. <laughs> it 10, is seconds, 10 seconds, 10 okay. seconds. Uh, what, what object single, is that? Single, the this one the, the 18, 18 millimeters apochromic optics no which object is this is that oh, a i am sorry in scorpius no 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 yes it's the scorpio the back the back nebula that is the bug oh, the bug God, nebula God. yeah I awesome see. god i can't yes. believe you're getting that with that little scope that is yes. <laughs> I am thinking in. Oh yeah. So um, what we're seeing the, after the, the global star party, I will, the, I will say. Fire. But in a big telescope, this looks like a big bow tie in the sky. You know. Yes. Um, and this is it's incredible. It's also called the Butterfly Nebula. It's a bipolar planetary nebula in Scorpius. Um, and. Uh, Wow, it's got some of the hottest stars known with surface temperatures in excess of 250,000 degrees. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh. We, get a sunburn there. Uh, we could have a barbecue there. Must wow. have been very large. Okay. Um, so this is really cool. Uh, it was um, the earliest known study. This is also called NGC 6302. Is by Edward Emerson Barnard, okay, who uh, Barnard is, was one of the greatest uh, visual astronomers of all time. Um, and uh, it says that ne Nebula featured some of the finest, or the first images released after the final servicing mission of the Hubble Space Telescope in September 2009. So, very cool. Okay, well. I find it another another. Oh, what happened to M twenty two? It was is it too low still? Because I know from there I remember it was lower. Uh, you tell me if you have if you like to find another another object now in the Scorpius. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, well, let's ask the audience here. Okay. Yeah. Yes, exactly. or the audience. Yes. What Sorry that my here? my field of view is very <laughs> short, very very narrow okay. because I That's have right. building. But don't I have the entire. Yes, I have um, the entire. The entire. Right. If I have in the field, the telescope don't have a oh, building. So tell them, Caesar. Tell them what constellations you can see, and then uh, in there. Now it's a Scorpius, Scorpius. Uh, that is falling in the east, and okay. maybe I'm try uh, M twenty two is maybe over the over the roof of of the yeah. But okay. I think that in ten minutes I'll I'll have in in the field of view. Let me try. I love Scott. Is it working? All will go to <laughs> like the software. That's here. Cool. I can show you. My uh, absolutely. I got the bug. You oh, ready you got for the bug. bug? Okay. Here comes my Ron's bug. Got the bug. Now mine. Yeah. I, I had a bug. Bring me the bug, Caesar. Was... You put the bug in me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here we go, baby. This is a big oh, scope. Wow. wow. 
That's Whoa, crazy. man. Quit bugging me. No. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. It, it actually Robert, helps to Robert wants to know, is the Swan Nebula up? You know, Omega Nebula. Oh, please. May I? <laughs> yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I did one for the magazine. Was that uh, Marcelo's magazine or Check somebody? I forget whose magazine it was. Uh, but, so uh, nebula, yes, it's different than the bug nebula. Let me try if I have in the field of view. There you go. That is a great bug. Wow. Nebula. See how good that looks. There's the swan. That, wow. that swan. This is yeah. the swan. Ah. That's a sketch, let's, by let's, the way. Let's see. Let's see if Caesar can get the swan. Come on, Caesar. You're up against my 32 now, right here. Uh, run me the, the NGC if, if, because it's, I think that this M17. I think I could give you the NGC number. Please write me in the, in the chat because I... here we go. I'll do it. Oh, yes, yeah, so any of us. So uh... you can see that this has many names. They call it the Omega Nebula. Yeah. Juan Nebula, I guess Omega because it has the whole like a, a train that I'm not quite sure, but I mean, this honestly is what I see. I see this in my big telescope with the DGM um, NPV filter, two inch. This is okay, the kind okay. of view you're going to get with a 28 inch from a nice dark site. This is my best work, Caesar. So it's, it's incredible. Come on. <laughs> you amazed me, man. That's excellent. That's my, my dad raised me in the art environment with Picasso and dollies. How couldn't I be an artist, you know? I was uh, blessed to see the greatest artist's work. Um, Rembrandt, yeah. Albert Caesar. Durer. NGC 6618. <clears throat> It, it, this is in, in Scorpius, uh, Swan. I don't no, uh, ah. it's in Sagittarius, I believe. Uh, ah, yes, 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 yes. It's creeping it's, up, though. Yeah. Um, yes. The northern two thirds of Sagittarius. Okay. Yes. I think that Sagittarius is a little, a little uh, over the roof of the balcony, unfortunately. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Next. One of the the global separate. I'm going to the roof again to have what about the entire sombrero. <laughs> Is sombrero up. Sombrero. Podría ser. Corvus. It, it will be. be sombrero. Sombrero galaxy. M seven. seven M one oh four. M one oh four. I'm gonna do the, my. Um, that's, that's in the constellation Virgo. But is yes, maybe. Let me check. Let me try. Let me try. 4590. 101. Ah. Yes. Ah, okay. Six, but we, now we are trying with NGC 6682. Uh, it's probably, it might be up for you. It's, it's probably west. I would say it's west, southwest from you. Um, but I, I yeah. don't know from your latitude, it might be yeah, higher up. Yes, this is here. Here I, I have the south in this area. It's um, good. And here is uh, Scorpio falling to the to the west, and appear in this area uh, Sagittarius. But it's mostly of Sagittarius now is over. My, unfortunately, I have the roof of the another balcony. It's very yeah. bad my, my situation. Is is great because it's my home and i can uh, try sometimes i can use the yeah. telescope in my living room but it's bad because it's really small area in the roof my internet connection is very bad this is the problem here you go uh, uh, maybe i have maybe i have m141 uh, maybe let me i i try i try with with uh, now with uh, sombrero Either. Here's my sketch. Yeah, it's beautiful. Says, turned on I love. I, I I love that. It's going with the horizon turned off. With with which telescope you uh, write this? this. Was with the with 20, the twenty inches. Twenty, 20 inches. Inch. Yeah, from uh, Mount Pinos. That's beautiful. 
Yes, you you captured the sensation of a big telescope, really. You know that that um sketch one that was the January cloudy night sketch contest yeah. winner for. Ah uh, no, it's it's over. Sorry, uh, here now is is under the clouds. Yeah, mm -hmm. under the under the horizon. Beautiful. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It's that. No, 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 no. It's okay. <laughs> Robert on uh, YouTube says I've seen that through a 16 inch, and it was haunting. It looked like yeah. it was on fire. He's talking. Oh, about it, it looks story. amazing. It got stuck in my brain like a catchy song. Trying for. Oh. Thanks yeah. for trying and sharing that drawing. Six 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 six. Thank you. Eighty one. Corvus is, has a great, a uh, lot of good stuff in it too. Uh, has a couple uh, interacting galaxy, galaxies, NGC 4038, which is uh, oh, very, very strong. Yeah. I think yeah, that now is, is, between is in the Caesar same area. John, have you guys ever had dreams where you're stargazing in, in a dream? Yes. Yeah, me too. Me and, too. and you know, what's weird is I could float in my dream. Meaning, I was not... I've had flying dreams, but not with stars. I've yeah, I was trying star <laughs> dreams. You know, some of them in color. You know, where the you can see colorful nebula and stuff. It's cool stuff. Yeah, that's what's amazing about photography is it actually shows you color, and and you don't see color when you're looking at these objects visually. Very little color. Once you got a really big telescope. Yeah, and and uh, some really, of the really brighter. dark skies. Yep. I saw I saw color in the Orion Nebula with uh, Jack Newton uh, in, wow. in Rodeo, New Mexico. Yeah, that's where I was. Incredibly dark and, and incredibly transparent. And we could see red color, like a reddish color through an eight inch at low power uh, in the Orion Nebula. It was just like, wow. Isn't that crazy in a little crazy? Color. And I've heard people doing it with a six inch. Yep. It just depends on the transparency. If you have extremely good transparency, uh, so you're going to get. Corkill said he had dreaming looking at the stars, but experiencing like looking through a telescope at stars. But there's no telescope in the dream, just stars. <laughs> That's my deal too, you know? I mean. You went from the lens to the um, right out through the scope. You're in. You're already yeah. in. <laughs> I can't do it at will, you know, because no. I'm stargazing in my dreams all the time, you know. I wish. I <laughs> wish. This was my eagle. So uh, oh, I wanted beautiful. to say yeah. at, at this last star party, this is how it looked again. I was able to see Remarkable. this level of detail with the um, NPB filter. Uh, DGM makes it. It's a great filter if uh, you're looking for something to enhance your nebula views. Yeah, uh, you, know, you, you could get that filter or even the Lumicon 03, the Gen 3. It's very good. But this NPB, it doesn't distort the star color as bad. So it's kind of nice, you know. <laughs> Mike I have Overacker says, OK, what is Scott on? That's <laughs> <laughs> fair. I know. I hey, wonder the I same. I'm on the universe, OK? <laughs> Photons, <laughs> man. <laughs> Tell him. <laughs> I don't need anything. I already got it. So yes, you guys are guys, I, I have M22 22 oh, in the nice. field. Okay. Okay. Let's go see. This is kind and of cool going between yes. live and it's a outside the roof. Is it is it the field now? Okay. Oh, I can't wait. This okay. is gonna be right. you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Here we go. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah, come on. Look at that little scope can show you this much. Unbelievable. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. There it is. Yeah. We can put wow. uh, less gain. Yes, 22. And 10 right. seconds. M22. Yes. We need information, Scott. <laughs> yes, it's kind well, of well, you know, in, the, a... in the application, is. I think that is a very good information in, in, in the application of uh, um, Messier 22, also known as Messier 22 of NGC 6656, is an elliptical globular cluster in the constellation of Sagittarius near the galactic bulge region 
Bulge, bulge, I don't know. Bulge. Bulge, sorry, bulge. Yeah. Okay, I think that you can read much better than me. <laughs> it's not an easy word to say in English, that's true. Um, it's M22 uh, is about 50 it meters in diameter and uh, yeah. is 9,785 light years away. Pretty far. It was discovered by Abraham Lell. Is that how you say it? In 1665. I don't. How, it's how's that spelled? It's I. I L L E. I L. Abraham Isle, I think, something like that. Yeah. To an amateur astronomer. An amateur astronomer. There you go. Oh wow! Yeah, it's and a metal metal on August 26, 1665, while observing Saturn. Wow! There you go. Oh, Pretty by the way, about. speaking of Saturn, did you tell everybody that two nights ago was Saturn opposition? So you want to get out? Yeah, you want to go out and see it. That's true. Yeah, unfortunately, in my field of vision, I don't have a Saturn because it's. Oh. It's it's very low on the horizon after sunset, so you have to wait till about nine or ten yeah. o'clock, and then it's starting to get up high enough here. Yeah. Do you see the planets in, overhead? Thank you. Do you know? <laughs> I, I, so, I'm sorry, sorry, John. I, I, it's just I read that I, I this cluster have seven seven. 70, sorry, 70,000 stars. Approximately. Oh, wow. It's incredible. Yes. And it's comparing with uh, Omega Centauri that we show Omega Centauri in the clouds yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I know. Incredible. 20, 32, uh, well, it's one of the nearest globular clusters in there uh, to here, to, to Earth, sorry, at a distance about 10,600 light years away. Wow. Well, hey, what about well, M8? John, John, continue with your presentation. And I, I, to M8. M8. <laughs> M8 is perfect. I have the Swan Nebula in a few okay. minutes because it now is. Uh, it's in the it's in view. It eclipse it, eclipse it by a wielding. How about M8, the lagoon? Lagoon, yes. A, a, a minutes more, I have lagoon in the field too, I think. Okay. Because fine. it's in the same area. Yeah, well, that's going to be an amazing <laughs> shot. You might even have the Triffid in there too. M20. Yes. I, yeah, I don't know with, with like, as tonight is it's um, a, a full moon. I don't know, but maybe we right. can it's see something of the tripod. Yes, yes. But we can try. We can try. I, I'll go to Swan Nebula because it's going to appear um, oh, in the back of, of a building. M22 also contains a planetary nebula. It wow. does? M22? I really? didn't know that. It has one. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. Wow, I've never seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was found by Fred Gillette in 1986 as a wow. point light. So it almost looks like a star, okay? But it's a planetary. But but um, I... I, uh, I planetary's nebula central star is a blue star. I'll share one, a few seconds more. Okay. But where is the... the, the but it's a nebula... I don't know. It's, uh, uh, no, yes, but maybe it's something that we need more exposure, more, more stacked pictures to see. It, I, I think M eight M eight would be good to find it. Okay, so this was not easy. Yes. No. No. Of course, that it, it will be uh, something very particular to to see. And this this nebula is called G like I, good, J J like Jack Jack, C like Charlie one. Wow. JJC1 is the designation. And this is so obscure that Wikipedia doesn't even list it. So. Yeah. I, I use it. I use it the information of the Explore Scientific application for my mount. Okay, that, good. <laughs> that is beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. Look at that. And, and this is this is the way 
that I explain for, for people that start to use nouns and this is very important. Stop and read the information of your application. <laughs> and it's beautiful. For me, I, I really enjoy that. Two black holes of between 10 and 20 solar masses each have been discovered initially with a very large array radio telescope in New Mexico. Look, this, this cluster have inside like um, Omega Centauri have two, two black holes inside. What is that we're looking at? It's incredible. It's That's amazing. That, it's amazing, totally. Wow. It's one of the beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, clustering, global clustering in the sky, uh, amazing. Sure. And visually, visually with a, 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 a well, with a 20, 20. Uh, oh yeah, you could see it was amazing. Exploding. Yes, I, I saw, I saw with a 14 inches many yeah. times and it's so big, it's incredible. Okay. Well, I M55 stopped share and, well. and I, I, I <laughs> Let me describe to you. This is this is amateur astronomers trying to find this planetary nebula in M22. Oh no! <laughs> a handful of amateurs who have reported spotting GJJC1. Their account seems to have four things in common. First, they were all using 20 inch plus telescopes. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. the observer had in hand a series of finder charts. You need finder charts showing the area around the target in increasing detail. So you can't just look at it and go, aha, there's the planetary nebula. It's like trying to find Pluto, all right? All we're using what I would call crazy high magnifications. That is in excess of 600 power. Yeah. In some cases, magnification exceeded 900 power. That means oh. the final common ingredient had to be very steady skies. Okay. Sure. Even minor air turbulence at these apertures and magnifications will quickly turn a, turn stars into mush. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, there you go. But it's right, out there for right. the finding. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's it's another amazing. planetary. This is um wow. Yeah, and you, th this is in that open cluster. So it's a it's a planetary. All right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you know, you get a little color in there. Um, this is in, um, I think it's, it's in M6 maybe or seven, one of those open clusters. I got it. I'm drawing a blank here. Alzheimer's again. <laughs> <laughs> Space time with Robert says, you guys are making this very hard for me to go to work. This is. <laughs> Well, this is what you'll see, and, and the only reason there's color, right? Is I'm trying to get Robert to come on Global Star Party next week, so we'll see if I can get him. Yeah. Uh, he says, speaking of Saturn and the recent opposition, how well do planets look in your big Newtonian compared to smaller scopes like a 10 inch? What would you say? I would say seeing dependent again, but yeah. I can tell you this: when the seeing opens up, you know the big scope's going to do very well, but. Yeah. When you have poor seeing, the smaller aperture telescope is always going to show you a better image. You're looking through much yeah, less because uh, air. Yeah. Yes, you're right. And, I can't and, tell uh, you how many times I sold a big telescope and got a complaint phone call saying, hey, my, the stars don't look any better through this telescope than they do through my binoculars or my toy telescope. Okay? Yeah. And, and that is a seeing condition problem you know you you, you have, have to have do that over your scopes weeks of time to to make a deduction of how well your optics perform yeah. Yeah. over yeah. many nights and many different conditions because right you know the bigger the scope the, the more it takes to open up this was sure. uh ngc 40 38 and corvus the rest uh, that's the, right yeah the antenna oh, uh the it's interacting and you know that Hubble shot shows you how much object. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's being destroyed from the pull of each other, you know. They basically you would think when the two like Andromeda's headed at us right now at what is it, how many miles per second? Yeah. And we so will collide in two million years, I guess. The stars. Um the Hubble's heritage site has good information about this. Yeah. It says, and you'll, wow. 
Uh, during the, the, the Swam Nebula is amazing, guys. Yeah. For, for a single picture that I have now, I have it in the center. Okay, of... Let's see it. Okay. Yes. Wow, the antenna, beautiful, your your right you. of you, okay, your... Okay, here we go. We're going to switch. Yes. 9,000 feet, it helps. 9,000 feet helps, yes. It yeah. does. It's too, I think that it's too much. It's too much for a, oh, for a Swam Look Nebula from, nice. from the... Oh, that's pretty I nice. I love that's this beautiful. telescope. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. It's too much. I think that this night I, I can go to sleep because... <laughs> <laughs> I can't go yeah. to sleep because before the global star party, I used to. I, I, I have a, a. First of all, I have a a gray gray. It's rewarding for me. Rewarding that the, the, the word that John. Uh, this is work. Mm -hmm. a part of your work for you, right? Yeah, it, it's. You have to have these experiences. Look, look the the, go the to work and sell telescopes and not do. Dude, this, this is yes. like this is as good as going viewing, hanging out with you. We're, Fifteen we're having... seconds. Fifteen yeah. seconds without guiding. That. My my polar alienation alienation is beautiful. Unbelievable and the tracking. I, I I give you. <laughs> My, I don't ever, ever, I, I don't lose my polar alienation because I use the, uh, my, my deck floor in the balcony. I put the legs of the tripod between the tables and I have the position. I am put this and you every day that I use is in the right polar thing. Of course, they have a little, a little, uh, error. So yes, I, I listen to you, John Herschel, uh, because you know we got a guy who likes to to, to uh, sketch here. So John Herschel made it. What he attempted was the most accurately drawn draw drawing of the nebula as part of a series of sketches of nebula uh, in 1833, and he published it in 1836. So that image, I'll bet is on the internet here, 1833, uh, Swan Nebula. I don't know if they called it the Swan then. I have more information here in, in, in your, your application, Scott. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, the Omega Nebula, I'm sorry, no, I don't, sorry, no, Omega Nebula, no, but ah, okay, it's Omega Nebula too. Okay, I, I thought first of all, I think that I yes. had the, the 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 yes, the wrong information. The Omega Nebula, also known as the Swan Nebula, oh, yeah. Chexbach Nebula, Lapser Nebula, and the Orso Horse Show Nebula. Sorry, catalogan yeah. as Messier seventeen or M. Well, M M seventeen. And as NGC 6680 uh, uh, 18 is an H or hydration to ration in the constellations of Sagittarius. It was discovered by Philippe Lois of Chesou. Ch well, I don't know, I don't speak French, but maybe it's Chesou <laughs> or something like this. Yes, I speak Excuse Italian, Argentinian, and English. Bonsoir, monsieur. <laughs> Bonsoir, Chesou. Chesou. I don't know. I'm sorry. But <laughs> Charles Messier catalog in in uh, a thousand um, sorry thousand seventy sixty four. It is located uh -huh. in the rich star fields of the Sagittarius area of the Milky Way. The Mega Nebula is between five thousand and six thousand light years from Earth, and it spans some fifteen light years in diameter. The cloud of interstellar matter of which this nebula is a part, it's roughly 40, 40 light years in diameter and mm -hmm. has a mass of 30,000 solar masses. Whoa. The That's total awesome. mass of the Omega Nebula is, is an estimate of 800 solar masses. I don't know how I, I can, at this hour, I can read in, in English because I am speaking <laughs> Argentinian. 800 Scottish solar Island. masses. <laughs> That's 800 quite solar big. masses is a craziness. Absolutely. Uh, 
it is considered one of the brightest and most massive star forming region of our galaxy. Yeah. It's a local geometry similar to the Orion Nebula, except that is by given a view, 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 view well, I don't know how it's pronounced, view, view, watcher or edge on rather than face on. This one is maybe I can explain because I, yes, my the English is not my <laughs> my no, it's okay. primary language. Okay. An open cluster of three five stars lie embedded in the nebulosity. Ah, okay, and causes the gases of the nebula to shine due to radiation from these hot young stars. Mm. However, the actual number of a star in the nebula is much higher, up to 800, 100 of a spectral type earlier than 89, and nine of a spectral type O, O of zero, I think, uh, plus more than 1,000 stars in formation of its outer ratio. It's mm -hmm. also one of the youngest cluster known, with an age of just one million years. It is crazy that we talk about one million years like something uh, young in our in the universe. <laughs> the luminous. <It's> a... <laughs> tell me, tell me, John. I don't know. Oh, it's a, it's just a tick on a planetary clock. You know, it's. Yeah. Million years isn't much time for a stellar, you know. Yeah, it's it's incredible. The swamp portion yeah. of the M seventeen, the, the omega, this, uh, through the years, through the decades, in the eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Here, let me let me show your picture. I did a little something to it real quick. Look, while, while we were playing, I did it on the fly. Yes. I, uh, show again, you. Sorry. I just tried to show, show again it. your your escape. My swan compare. Okay. Oh, I, I, I'm read something about the sketch of Swamp Nebula. Listen, to I that. have to go full screen. Oh, there we go. Yes, yes. Okay. The there first attempt to accurately draw the nebula as part of the series of a sketch of nebula was made by, by John, another John, Eric, uh, <laughs> a great name. Herschel in Herschel. John Herschel, yes. 1833. 1833. So let me show you what that looks like. Okay. Because I, I found the drawing. Okay. This is. Oh, man. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Now, I yes. want you guys to remember. I want you to remember what John Schwartz's drawing looks like. Okay. So, John, just for a second, once you share your swan nebula drawing just so everybody okay. has a reference yes we need okay. to compare the okay. Okay. Image, to john a live image yes That's there's great. yours i just i did yours i played with it look i just enhanced it a little bit and so <laughs> that's yours i took a cell phone snapshot of the screen and i did a little processing just to show you you know that's your baby right there not okay. bad, right? Now let's go to your drawing. Yes, it is is the same, but uh, ah yes. <laughs> I think amazing. Herschel's gonna be mad at me. Okay, so that's your drawing. Okay, now this is this is eighteen thirty three. Um, John Herschel. Let's see if I can do this. Here we go. This is better because. Oh wow! Wow, that is amazing. Now this is just okay. So let me see. Um, I I agree with the with the bar structure, but I don't know. But by Herschel C, the head, the another food. thing, right. maybe maybe imagination or whiskey. I don't know. Both. <laughs> Both. <laughs> No, no, but the most accurate description of the Swan Nebula, the, the Omega Nebula of that time, but arguably yes, one of the world's greatest astronomers, you know, at the time. Yeah. Herschel don't have the telescope of John Schwartz. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yes, it's true. But yeah, I, I mean, think that is yeah, some. Sure. I'm sorry, sorry, John. Tell, tell, no, I'm just saying aperture really does make a difference in what you see. Yeah. 
like you know like this picture i did this is literally what i'm seeing in my eyepiece yes and maybe and the filter the filter helped it's really the filter does this that make the difference yes the aperture make the difference and, and, and again uh you know this is this isn't just drawn right this is yeah, like beautiful. probably two years of work I, I, I wonder it. i wonder if herschel would have seen your drawing and just been in utter disbelief or if he would have said you know well, if I had the scope, I could show them because, you know, you back then, exactly. the light pollution, there was none. So if you were to take our telescope of today and bring yeah. it to the sky, this is exactly his what sky. you would. Yeah, his Maybe sky. better. Dark. Super dark. It was pitch black back yeah. then. You yeah, can't imagine, like, how dark. No, no. Put an O3 filter on it or something. He would have just. You could just wear O3 yeah, he filter. would have went to a coma and like, disbelief. I go John Lennon with O3 glasses. <laughs> yeah. You just be able to see everything. And, you know, you when you go down, you're trying to show us something here, Caesar. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, on, yes, Caesar. the quantity of information. I oh, never yeah, there's, seen there's a lot. <laughs> this quantity of information about the in application yeah. of astronomy application. Congratulations. By the, yes, yes. I, I love because the the I, I i forget the name of of the application sorry um explore stars the, the, the this application for 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 the x mount oh yeah it's yeah. it's something that is made with love really but because ah. only people that make with with a, a a lot of love by astronomy make an entire book about swan <laughs> nebula That's and true. something that something that i i I found something that that describe that, that one that you show us, Scott, and in, in mm -hmm. the in the John Herschel uh, sketch. Yes, uh, that this is say that the figure of the nebula is nearly that of a great capital omega, uh, somewhat distorted and very inequality bright. Yes, and, and describe. The, the thing that we see in the in the sketch of John Herschel, Monsieur perceive only the bright eastern branch, eastern sorry branch of the nebula now in question, without mm -hmm. any of the attached com convolutions. Which what well, is really a, a, too too large, but it's very interesting. I I encourage him to the people to to download. If don't have the, uh, and despite that they the people that don't have uh, EXOS mount, yeah, even I encourage mount, to download it. for <laughs> their the cell phone because it's full of information. I I love because it's many, really few times you have. Yes, it's free. It's free. Yeah, it's free. Yeah, and, and you can beautiful. This is information. I you I just pull the scope from that with your cell phone. Everything oh, right there. So Robert Robert is making a point about Herschel here. He says that he had to sit in front of his telescope, so he had a he had a front view telescope. He didn't. This was not a new tone. Oh, that's system. why. Right. So he's blocking yeah. out light out of his telescope. That's, that's probably his head in the way. So the dude did. I guess he didn't even have an eyepiece. Is that right? Yeah. They so just, just looked at the, the aerial image of the nebula out in 3D. It would look like in 3D in front of his telescope. You know, uh, and I've done this with Newtonian telescopes. You look kind of at the mirror and then focus your eye out into the air, you know, right? To where the image is starting to come to focus. And, um, it's easier on a brighter object to do it, but once you once you learn how to do it, you can do it on anything that's in the sky, and um, uh, and you can see it's just weird. It looks like stardust in the air, you know, when you do this. It's cool. Yeah, it's really different because it's a trick to focus your eyes on that. It, it you have to. It's like one of those view things where it pops in and out. Yeah. But once it once it comes into view, you can keep your eyes on it. Yeah, Norm Hughes is talking about the eighty triplet that you have here, and he says 
He said, they're absolutely the best telescopes and everybody should own one. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, well, I'll Nicole tell Cox you this. Says he's getting his ready to do some work. Hope I can get as good as Caesar with mine. Uh, and uh, yeah, and Norm says, well, I can help you. I, we can always do mm -hmm. Skype. That's right, guys, don't forget, you know, you can help each other out no matter where you are because we got something called the internet and a bunch of free software that lets us communicate uh, around the world. So it's really cool. Guys, I've got I two more. I, can I do two more? Do two more and then I got to go eat. I'm, I'm hungry. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just go. Um, you did? I'm, I'm going Swanee. So uh, what I, yeah, Swan again. So what I've done is um, I've, I've introduced a, my white light sketch the, the, before I inverted it. Okay. I'd like to show you the level of detail that, right. that I've, I've accomplished, which is quite amazing. And then um, I've got the, the cell phone snapshot I wanted to show you. It's a little shaky. I just held it up. Again, this is through the 28 inch. So we're good. Let's go here. Back in. I'm getting a little better at this, finally. <laughs> this is a cell phone snapshot oh, wow. yeah. of the swan. And I just held it up to the eyepiece. So, you know, I got a little smear going. But, I mean, look at what a cell phone shows you. So, you think those guys would like it back then if we had our cell phone with us? <laughs> it would have blown their minds. You know? I mean, wow. look at, you're seeing color in there. And, and wow. that's just a, a quick you know three second shot look at the amount of detail i'm getting yeah. herschel might have argued with you about the color you know yeah you i don't know there. if you use the 70 speculum you'd see color yeah there's the actual original pencil sketch okay so just look at how intricate it is i mean it, it's almost abstract until you invert it and then, of course, I had to work on it smoothing. This is just the, the like the rough after the field, you know, before inversion. But you could see what it, what it teaches you to study the things you see. Like, look at the, the wing of the swan. I mean, those details with, with averted vision after hours of study, these little details start to pop out. And when you put that shroud over your head, oh, yeah. Yeah, it really, everything. Well, isn't that what the Herschels did too? They would go like into a dark yes. room or something, like a portable dark room or something, and mm -hmm. sit in there for an hour. Man, this has been plus what having a, dark skies. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, gosh, that seeing yeah, back then because the they had to get out of the starlight, right? The yeah, because the but starlight was have, so bright. Herschel you could didn't have global star party, which is sad but i know this is the best <laughs> thing ever. it's I, like i think if I'm you not, put this tonight you'd be going wow you know these are maybe uh, we should hook up and i can have you do a few pictures for me real quick <laughs> i i need some uh omega centauri shots and and a few of the hamburger galaxies if you could the uh 5139 or 5128 See, dude, I'm getting hungry. You're talking about okay, yeah. Galaxies. All right, let's let it go. Here's the last thing. Uh, this See, is that, what. That's a beautiful ending shot. Yeah, there. and that that right there is, um, you know, when you're at the eyepiece near Zenith, you don't want to fall off. But yeah, that's look at that beautiful sky and, and all those telescopes. What a great night. I think we officially kept John right up all night long. He says, thanks. <laughs> Enjoy your well-deserved meal. Get it's your coffee, to go make sir. tomorrow's coffee. <laughs> so, yeah. Black rifle. Black rifle's really yeah, strong. Right. Yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs> thanks for watching. Yeah. If, if you like to, to close with... And go out and yeah. Uh, Put it up for closing image. Yeah. What do you got? Yeah. If you guys got I, clear skies out there, no matter where you are, you know, get out there and yeah. observe for a few minutes, you know, I, even I a have, naked eye. Grab your so little Saturn. Saturn's anything. up. It's ready. Yeah. It's calling. Eduardo Simone saying hello. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, what John. A wonderful. Thank you, we should have like a ending song, but I, you guys do not want to hear me sing. No. So, yeah. <laughs>
I was <laughs> contemplating writing a song, but I'm a little embarrassed at this point. I don't know. Maybe if I go as an alien, I could. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> What's a wonderful, a wonderful end of the global party? Yes, Caesar. Uh, thank you. Yes, comparing yes, live image awesome. with the My sketch shots. of John. Man. And then and, and, and John Herschel. We're oh, with John, John Herschel too. Holy we we bring to, great to, audience. To the spirit of, of yeah. John Herschel here. Yeah. yeah he, he's you. looking yeah. down on us. The ghost of Herschel. Yeah. I, I have. have we got to find close. a nebula that we can name. Ghost yes. Of I have I have the Lagoon Nebula in the field, if you like. Oh, what? yes. Yeah. Few right, seconds. Let's do it. Few let's seconds. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. Okay. Live. <laughs> live. Live. Peter, you're killing it tonight. Live Good job. Memorex. That's. See, that's dating me. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, oh man, is. look at that. Yeah, the yeah. Lagoon Nebula. That's beautiful. Yes, Lagoon Nebula for everyone <laughs> from yeah. Buenos Aires, from My. the city, in a How full moon this? night, in a full moon man. night. This is crazy. Magic. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Yes. With a full moon, yes. you're sitting. Full moon. 15 yeah. seconds each. I, each I hear semester. so many amateur astronomers complain about guy I can't see anything I can't do anything I live in the city blah blah blah, blah. this yes is, this is from yes Caesar's balcony okay yes so, don't have excuse use your telescope no you're not cooking hamburgers are you on that balcony or he may he makes pizza yes. I and you don't you you can yes yes I make pizza yeah, yeah I made pizza barbecue. yes and I, I love yes. pizza Yes. My favorite. I have, especially in, 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 I love to, to I bet the army the dog, the dog, yeah. 4,000 yeah. light years away. And um, it is. Boy, that's almost as close as uh, Alpha Centauri. Maybe, yeah. Right? 4,000 light? 4,000 and 6,000. Yes. I think it's, it, it's the nearest. Measured distances. Maybe we should go there instead of the, you never know. You never know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> What's oh, discovered this by Guillaume Legendil? A tornado like structure caused by yeah. a hot O type star that emanates ultraviolet light, heating and ionizing gases on the surface of the nebula. The Lagoon Nebula also contains an at its center a structure known as the Hourglass Nebula, so called by John Herschel. Yeah, I mean, wow. I, you know named everything, which should not be confused with the better known engraved hourglass nebula in the constellation Musca. In 2006, four Herbig Hero objects were detected within the hourglass, providing direct evidence of active star formation by accretion within it. So there you go. Yeah, you guys, so there's a little homework for you out there. You learn about the Herbig Hero objects. They're very strange and very interesting. So, are those all stellar objects? The Herbert Harrell? Herbert Harrell, the bright patches of nebulosity. Okay. With newborn stars. So it's like so, super ionized, you know. Wow. Yeah. That's so from the, maybe it's the transition cloud. between nebula and star or something like that. So, yeah. But Herbert Herbert and Guillermo Harrell are that's, those are the first astronomers to study them in detail so yeah well you better get some dinner yeah, scotty thank you yeah uh -huh. singing to me in my stomach can you sing it? <laughs> yes yes uh, oh my god it, it's really really you are in Argentina. Uh, time to dinner. It's not. For, right? This is. It's not for you. No, no, no. This because is, I, I, in Argentina, I know this is when you start. Yes. Dinner, right. So. I, 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 I took my dinner tonight. Uh, I started to 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 put in the in the in the spiedo uh, a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> and, now, but I no, yes yes earlier. Yeah, this is your normal and time. I, I yes I, I I took my dinner with my family at ten o'clock. And I returned nice. to here. Yes, yes, but was after my presentation earlier. <laughs> but, oh, I see. No, no, but yeah, you know, guys, you guys, need to go. You. to Let me do. Let me do the. Um, let me show you Mike's lagoon. 
so this is the lagoon after it's been processed, somewhat processed. I don't even think he processed it yet. But uh, this is the lagoon from Mount Pinos last month in oh, full wow. glory. And that's uh, Mike Garrett. You know Mike. And um, wow, he's, he's in a ZWO and a six-inch six telescope. Those dark nebulous structures in there. That's really Six cool. inches. Look. That's what six inches gets you. You six will never inches. see that in a 30 inch telescope. Never. Wow. No, it, it's that amazing, beautiful. John. That's beautiful. It's Thanks. amazing. And amazing. that's so where's the hourglass? Is it is it the dark in the middle? Is that what that is? The divide? In the middle. Yeah. 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 Look you at know, all the those the, the baby stars. Yeah. This is I yeah, can't take credit this for this. A, this is a star factory. It's the it's a womb. He's wow baby stars yes yeah. you're yes. looking He's into the heart of creation. that whole thing yeah. that's so amazing yeah wow right. thank you mike very nice. <laughs> very nice all right guys all right guys good night thank, thank good you night. what a wonderful yeah. night yeah good night fun. to the audience we'll do it again next tuesday 120 yes. star party next tuesday starts tuesday. at 6 okay. p.m uh, you know, at a computer screen near you. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. See you guys. Caesar. Good job, man. Doing this week. Uh, really nice. Night. I enjoyed yeah. that. Fun. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. And um, uh, sorry for some of my technical difficulties starting up, but we had an awesome star party. So that makes up for it. Take care and good night.